with our good friends from our Public Works Department um, pertaining to dockets 0559 through 0563, orders for the fiscal year 19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements, as well as dockets 0564 through 0565, capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd like to remind folks in the chamber that this is a public hearing uh, broadcast and recorded on RCN channel 82, uh, Comcast channel 8, Verizon 1964 and streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. I'd ask uh, folks in the chamber to silence their electronic devices at the conclusion uh, at the uh, conclusion of the presentation by the department and questions from my colleagues. Uh, we have, uh, we'll take public testimony. There's a sign-in sheet to my left by the door. We ask that you state your name, affiliation, residence, and check mark the box that says you wish to testify. Uh, there are numerous other ways to submit public testimony. You can email us at ccc.wm at boston.gov, as well as uh, U.S. Mail uh, to the Committee on Ways and Means, Boston City Hall, 1 City Hall Plaza, Boston 02201. Uh, and we're also going to have a hearing specifically dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 5th, between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, Again, I'd like to welcome our team, Chris, um, Mike, PJ, and Ann, and your colleagues up in the chamber. Welcome, everyone. And I'll turn it over to Chris after I introduce City Councilor at Larger, Anissa Sabi George. Thanks for being here. Oh, and thank you. And Councilor Chris Janey to my right. Kim. Jane to my right. <laughs> <What's your name? laughs> I was a snack. I don't know, someone called us. <laughs> okay. Councillors, thank you so much. Councillors, thank you so much for the opportunity to present Mayor Walsh's FY19 budget for the Public Works Department. As you noted, uh, I'm joined by our budget director, Ann Carbone, our superintendent of street operations, Michael Broll, uh, and uh, Parajaya Singh, who leads our uh, engineering division. Uh, and as you also noted, in many ways, more importantly, we're joined by the women and men who really do so much of the actual day-to-day -day work and uh, for whom the, the, the good impact that we're having on our streets uh, is really the result of uh, what they are doing every single day. And I, I want to also recognize uh, District 4 in particular, Jamie Clementi and all the men and women that work out of my district. Thank that's you. A, that's appreciated. Um, the mayor really has two big charges for our department. Uh, the first is to deliver exceptional basic city services, and the second is to, to design and build great streets. Uh, in that first category, really under the, the hard work and leadership of, of Mike Broll, we've had a great year at delivering uh, basic city services. We just survived, uh, or more than survived, a, a winter where we saw about 60 inches of snow, uh, which is about a foot and a half more than what the city of Boston typically gets, and that also includes uh, some particularly memorable snowstorms, one on January 4th that was coupled with a, a nor'easter, one in the beginning of March, which happened to be the largest single day of snowfall in March in the city of Boston's history. Um, we also, sort of outside of snow season, filled about 11,064 potholes through the end of April and responded to over 15,000 street cleaning requests across the city, again, sort of through the end of April. Uh, and that's in addition to sort of the, the core work that we do supporting uh, events uh, that happen in our city, things like First Night and the Marathon on the large scale, and also the Love Your Block efforts that are happening in each of your uh, neighborhoods uh, over last weekend, this weekend, and beyond. Um, and I would say that uh, one of the things that we have pride ourselves in, and since this is a budget hearing, uh, there's a lot of good work that uh, Mike has been leading in, uh, to think about how we become more efficient and more effective at the work that we do every single day. Um, and that has in part been looking at how we uh, shift some of our work from contracted uh, operations to actually bring some of that work in-house. So supported by our central fleet team, you see in this budget an additional savings of around $145,000, uh, largely by uh, some increased efficiency 
uh, on the uh, street sweeping, sweeping side. Uh, in addition to all the work on the highway division, uh, we are also uh, hard at work uh, on the waste reduction side. Uh, and with uh, the good support of this council and uh, Councillor O'Malley's, uh, I think, uh, particular interest uh, during the course of the last budget cycle, this year we've been able to expand the number of yard waste pickups uh, to 18 uh, over the course of this calendar year, uh, which means that essentially from the week of April 23rd all the way through the first week of December, every other week in the city of Boston, almost every other week in the city of Boston, there will be yard waste pickup. Uh, and that complements some of the other work that we're doing around composting uh, in the city. And as is, uh, this council, I think, is well aware, at the end of this coming fiscal year, at the end of FY19, many of our trash and recycling contracts expire. So with that in mind, uh, Mayor Walsh kicked off what is called the Zero Waste Planning Initiative, which our waste reduction team is very deeply engaged in. Uh, and this initiative is a collaboration between your constituents, uh, the Energy, Environment, and Open Space Cabinet, and the Public Works team to really think about how we actually, as a city, uh, can do more to reduce, reuse, and recycle uh, across the board. Um, in addition to waste reduction, we are also hard at work on the street lighting side, making sure that our streets are well lit and safe. Uh, and there's a lot of terrific progress that's happening uh, within the street lighting division. Uh, last week, for example, we actually fixed more street light outages in one week uh, than in any other week in the last uh, 12 months, uh, which is a credit to a lot of the work that's going on. And, Councillor, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, that work is going to be really reinforced by some vacancies we will be filling to bring on some new mechanics, uh, as well as somebody in our stock room who can help us do inventory management. And as I know is of interest to the Council, uh, we are also going to be piloting some new technology on our street lights um, to really think about what the next generation of uh, LED lights might look like in the city, and that's in addition to the conversation we'll be having, the working session we'll be having uh, with Councillor Flynn and others uh, at the end of this week to talk about, about stray voltage. Um, all of that work, the work of our street lighting team, the work of our waste reduction team, our highway team, uh, is well supported by uh, our central fleet group, which uh, helps procure and maintain uh, and manage the fleet for uh, many departments across the city, obviously including public works, transportation, and others. Um, among the many things over the course of this past year uh, that has been uh, sort of uh, wonderful steps for our, uh, our central fleet team to take, you'll notice in the budget um, a slight reduction in the communications line. That's because our central fleet team has helped us transition to a new platform for our GPS system that we use in our vehicles, we've moved to a platform called, uh, by a company called Samsara, which essentially is giving us some better information about the condition of our vehicles, more importantly, the location of our vehicles during our events, and as well as sort of new ways of doing after action reviews uh, it, during the sort of post storm uh, or post uh, event work. Um, that's in addition to some, the procurement of some new vehicles and new vehicle types. Uh, Central Fleet has been uh, supporting the highway division's work around maintaining new infrastructure uh, like protected bike lanes across the city and has been able to purchase a couple of specialty uh, pieces of equipment uh, for that. In addition to all of the sort of core operations work, a large amount of the work that the team collectively does is around designing and building streets uh, in the city. And you'll notice in this capital budget, um, there's actually an increase of about $16 million, both across general obligation bonds and uh, uh, grant sources of, of funding. Um, that goes to a huge variety of different projects. Core among that is a set of work that PAR is leading uh, around uh, bridge and bridge investment uh, in our city. As folks might have seen, uh, this past weekend was a rather uh, remarkable weekend for bridge reconstruction in the city of Boston. Uh, in the period of about 72 hours or 72 hours and 45 minutes, as I think Par uh, uh, completely clocked it at. Um, the Mass Ave bridge over Com Ave was demolished, the bridge deck was replaced, and the road was resurfaced. 72 hours to basically comprehensively do the sort of major reconstruction work uh, that happened to the Mass over Com bridge. There's some additional work that still needs to be done on that bridge, uh, which is why it's still reflected in this budget. Uh, there's also the significant reconstruction of uh, the North Washington Street Bridge, the bridge that connects the North End to Charlestown, uh, which will happen over the next uh, five to six years and will be one of the largest bridge projects in the city's history. Uh, similarly, uh, this year there is funding in the budget for uh, some uh, additional work on the Alfred Street Bridge, which is the bridge that connects essentially uh, Charlestown with sort of the Charlestown Everett section uh, north of the city. 
as well as uh, the Dana Ave Bridge uh, in Council McCarthy's district. Uh, in addition to those uh, projects, obviously there's a, a pair of uh, signature bridges that are also in this budget, uh, one uh, that is of uh, great importance to us and great importance to the mayor, uh, which is uh, the Long Island Bridge. Um, there's funding in this, uh, in this budget um, for us to be able to take that bridge forwards, really, so that we can actually do the important work that this uh, council has been uh, long an advocate for, which is extending the continuum of care for those who are uh, who are suffering or battling with addiction. Uh, by rebuilding uh, the Long Island Bridge, we'll be able to reopen a recovery campus uh, on Long Island. And over the course of this year, uh, we plan on having a series of public conversations, both through the formal permitting channels uh, and with, uh, with the community to think about uh, what the reconstruction process looks like. Uh, and then that will lead to a, the actual uh, construction work that would happen uh, in the out years. In addition to that, there's funding in this budget uh, for the reconstruction of the Northern Ave Bridge, which as folks uh, know connects the South Boston waterfront uh, to downtown Boston. Uh, as that work uh, goes forward, we're really prioritizing four key things. One is how we actually improve mobility, how we improve people getting into and out of the South Boston waterfront, which is an issue we uh, hear from stakeholders uh, about quite frequently. We also recognize there's a need to be able to honor history as part of this project, um, that we really need to uh, sort of honor the fact that this is sort of a, a symbol of Boston's industrial past and this area's industrial past. Uh, also to create a destination on the waterfront and well as, as well as to think about how this bridge can play a role in the overall sort of resiliency strategy um, for the Fort Point Channel, for South Boston, the South End, uh, and beyond. In addition to the bridges, a huge amount of our focus uh, is on uh, sort of investing in our Main Street districts. Um, so over the course of this year, we will be finishing up work uh, at Hyde Square in Jamaica Plain and Audubon Circle in the Fenway. We'll be starting work uh, in North Square uh, in the North End. There's a specific line item in here to be able to advance something which has been um, long advocated for by our partners at Walk Boston and Wendy Landman, who is here, uh, in collaboration with the Elderly Commission. Uh, the Elderly Commission and Walk Boston uh, noted in a, in a report called Age-Friendly Boston that one of the things that we need to do as a city to be age-friendly, to be uh, a, a great place for seniors, is to add more benches, more benches particularly in our Main Street districts. There's $90,000 in this budget um, to be able to increase the number of benches that we can be putting on our streets. Uh, and we're really looking at some of those areas that were first identified as part of uh, that Age-Friendly Boston initiative, uh, East Boston, Mattapan Square, among others. Uh, in addition to the Main Street's work, um, there's a huge amount of focus on some of the key corridors in our city. Uh, so the ComAv uh, Phase 2A work continues. Um, PARS team is moving forward with the planning around ComAv Phase 3 and Phase 4. Um, there is funding in this budget uh, to really start the planning work around uh, the uh, sort of Columbia Road project. Uh, this is uh, in the budget as under sort of the notion of the Emerald Necklace. The original notion of the Emerald Necklace was actually to continue from Franklin Park back up to Moakley Park. The money in this budget allows us to start the planning process around that corridor. Uh, also in this budget is uh, uh, funding for uh, some of the long-standing projects, the Rutherford Ave reconstruction, uh, the Melnia, uh, Melnia Cass uh, reconstruction, among others. Um, there's also uh, funding that uh, in this budget to be able to really support a lot of the uh, sort of housing growth that we are seeing in our city. Um, in particular, uh, there's a, a set of projects really clustered around uh, uh, the Madison Park uh, area uh, where we'll be uh, sort of coordinating uh, work with our partners at D&D &D and BHA to uh, redesign streets like uh, Ruggles, Whittier, among others, uh, and reconstruct those areas, and uh, to be able to put some additional funding into the streets around the ink block to be able to make sure that the traffic pattern, the design of uh, those streets really uh, support the growth that we're seeing there. Uh, and as, as well as a small bit of funding to support a, uh, a new development uh, off of Amory Street near Jackson Square in Jamaica Plain. Uh, in addition to sort of all of the sort of the, the new growth projects, um, the bread and butter of what we do in many ways is the sort of the core resurfacing uh, and, uh, uh, and reconstruction of our sidewalks, resurfacing our streets, reconstruction of our sidewalks. Uh, that's really led by Katie Cho and her team. Uh, we will be doing around 40 miles of roadway resurfacing uh, across the city of Boston, across your neighborhoods over the course of this year. Uh, we will also be reconstructing around 500,000 square feet of sidewalks across your neighborhoods. And as many of you know, because uh, Katie, I think, has briefed, briefed each one of you on this, 
Uh, we're taking a different approach to the long-term capital investment of sidewalks. Rather than simply responding to 301 requests, we're really trying to foreground equity as part of the way in which we are prioritizing um, our sidewalk work. So we're looking at places where sidewalks are uh, in poor condition, are heavily used, and are places that uh, have been underinvested in, in the past. Um, across the board, and to wrap up, we also are looking at sort of resiliency in all of our capital and operating work. So there's a specific line item in this budget uh, of $150,000 uh, to be spent essentially between uh, both Katie's work and Mike's work to think about how in the course of our, uh, our general uh, sort of capital projects and our maintenance that we are actually ensuring that we are dealing with things like urban heat island effect or inland flooding. Uh, and we'll be using that $150,000 to advance some of the efforts that we uh, need to, to maintain things like uh, permeable, per, permeable surfaces uh, that we've already built in the city of Boston, uh, as well as looking at some new design standards around resiliency. Um, so in, in total, uh, this budget, I think, sort of moves forward. A lot of the things that you guys have been uh, appropriately sort of uh, reaching out to us about uh, and really reflects those, sort of those two charges the mayor has given us, deliver excellent basic city services, uh, build uh, great streets in our city. Uh, and I really, again, want to thank each of you for uh, your collaboration over the course of this last year and thank uh, the women and men who uh, we have the honor of uh, supporting every single day uh, who are out there uh, making sure that our streets are great. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. And uh, let me recognize, uh, we've been joined by so several of my colleagues. To my far left, Councillor Tim McCarthy, Councillor Matt O'Malley, Councillor Frank Baker, Councillor Ed Flynn, and to my far right, Councillor Lydia Edwards has just joined us. Um, you know, I think we're all happy that you expanded the yard waste because it, it's the perfect um, analogy of no good deed goes unpunished because we never did pick up yard waste in, during the summer months, and when we did, it was one of those things where I put out my waste this week and they didn't come. Well, they never came before, but it was, it was tough to, uh, you know, get people the actual schedule. So, again, I think it's, it's been a great um, benefit to the, to the residents that we expanded that. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the commissioner's office has taken a hit the past couple of years. H how do you arrive at, um, you know, being able to take those decreases this year, 12% decrease this year, as well as a smaller in decrease last year? Yep. So there's a small shift in and correct me I'll go straight. There's a small shift of a position essentially from the commissioner's office uh, to what is known as the office of the streets, um, which I think accounts for a portion of that. Uh, but we're also seeing that uh, as we think about where our investment priority uh, is, that we really want to make sure that we're investing sort of into the divisions that are actually sort of executing on the streets. Is that fair? Yeah. <laughs> So is it staff, a reduction in staff and There's a switch in staff? staff from, yes, okay, exactly. Right. That's, it is basically a, a shift in positions from one, uh, from the commissioner's office line item to uh, some right. other divisions, which sort of more accurately reflects uh, right. sort of where people are actually working. Right. And um, we talked a little bit about the snow budget before the hearing, but uh, it was a strange winter to say the least. We had the massive snowstorm in early January, and then February was like spring, and then March was like winter. And uh, how, where, where do we end up? So with the the rolling snow average after it goes through every five years is 22.5 million. We're going to end up right around I think in 24, 5, 23. So about a, uh, two million dollars over average. Um, we were trending very well through the light February, um, and then winter hit in March. Um, the later winter affected us in having to replenish salt piles, um, mm -hmm. a bit more burden on um, our budget. Uh, we don't, so we had, as um, the chief mentioned, we get 60 inches of snow, 17 inches over average, but it's those small little ice events that don't show an accumulation, right. but we have to respond salt, to. Salt. We have to roads. salt, we have to yeah. call in contractors, we have to make sure that the streets are ready. I, on those large storms that are named, that school gets canceled um, mm -hmm. is, they're expensive. The right. smaller events that occur when school's on can be pricey because school's on, because we have to make sure roads are ready for 5 a.m. commutes. Um, right. So we've done some good work staffing accordingly going forward. This past year we started with a 5 a.m. shift that's far stronger with more drivers than years past. That allowed us to actually have to call in contractors less but be ready for that school bus. We think about school buses um, from pretty much Halloween until this year, um, April 15th-ish. Mm -hmm. um, and this new shift allowed us, uh, under the leadership of Danny Nee at that 5 a.m. shift, he had about, he could deploy 50 to 60 trucks where in years past we'd have eight guys 
Um, right. We had an ice event the day after the Super Bowl parade two years ago. Mm -hmm. That was a problem. Um, <clears throat> we were left, you know, having to react and scramble. This new shift structure allowed us to be ready to handle those events without white knuckling and having to push a button for larger contractor callouts. Right. Um, I just wanted to shift quickly. You mentioned, uh, you know, how we're doing sidewalks and re reconstruction. Yep. We're, we're taking a different approach. And yep. let me recognize Eric Prentice as my liaison. I'm always calling Eric. I want to thank him and Mark Cartarelli and um, Kevin Linsky and Katie. Uh, very responsive. And, um, you know, we had a meeting last year, and I, I, I know that we're doing things a little differently. Can you kind of... Um, get in a little detail about uh, the rationale behind that. Yep, so uh, there's sort of two pieces of our response to uh, maintaining sidewalks. Uh, one is sort of the immediate response. Uh, that will not change. Um, mm -hmm. So you call us around uh, sort of a missing brick, uh, a broken paver, uh, some asphalt that needs some work. Um, our team will still go out there and we're trying to invest in ensuring that they have all the right tools uh, mm -hmm. and training they need to be able to do that. The piece that we are looking at is the, is the long-term capital repair. And typically what we would do uh, is uh, for the site selection for long-term capital repair, it would be largely based upon places where we'd received phone calls in the past, through one requests in the past. Mm -hmm. And what we realized by doing some analysis is that the where we got calls and where there was need didn't exactly line up. Mm -hmm. And so there has been some work uh, by Katie and her team to really map where there's the most need for uh, investment in our sidewalks. Uh, and really looking not just at uh, sort of the condition of the sidewalks, uh, but where we've uh, historically underinvested in uh, in sidewalk investment in the, in the past, and where there's sort of networks of, uh, uh, sort of pedestrian networks within our city. So not just looking at spot repairs, but sort of real pedestrian right. connections. Uh, through that work, basically, there were seven clusters of air, uh, that were sort of identified in the city as uh, areas that we really need to be increasing our investment. Uh, a couple of those, uh, essentially the, the Garrison Trotter uh, Humboldt uh, Ave area will be one of the areas of focus over the course this year, as will Orchard Gardens. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're sort of making more intentional investment uh, in some of those areas that have received less investment in the past. Right. How are we doing with ADA ramps? Um at yep. this point. Yep. So we, uh, I believe, uh, last construction season got around 906, a little over 900, 906 uh, ADA ramps that were brought into compliance. That is roughly what we would expect to do over the course of this year. It's funded at about $1.6 million, as you, as you know from the budget. Right. Um, the way in which we, we, we believe we are on track to get um, the majority of, or all of the ADA ramps completed um, before the, uh, bef sort of ahead of schedule, essentially. Right. Um, on a district level, mm -hmm. I have a crosswalk, and it's been um, in disrepair for a while. I think we've, pe you know, did, filled it like a pothole, but it has those uh, kind of cobblestone bricks. It's in Brighton Center, at, right at the corner of Chestnut Hill Ave. I've been meaning to call someone about it to, to look at it, but if you could um, on, a, on a constituent level. Yep. And uh, finally, the You've invested in bringing street sweeping more in-house yes. and also purchased some uh, the mini um, street sweepers slash plows. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So we've, through the last year's conversation with the budget, we talked about maybe internalizing some of that contractual work, taking some of that pay that we give to um, good companies who do good work by us, but kind of making it inside, giving, giving some of our folks some work. Um, through the good work of, uh, of um, CFM with Billy Coughlin, we made some smart purchases of some large sweepers, also some smaller, more specialty sweepers, for both for alley work in the North Ends and um, Charlestown, but also the bike networks. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to internalize our District 6 sweeping program, which is a non-posted program in West Roxbury. Mm -hmm. um, we, for years, had put, had, had, had that um, a contractor sweeper um, mm -hmm. for, the, for the normal seven months of sweeping, um, and we decided to pilot it. We spent but a month and a half beforehand timing it out. Could we do it? Could we actually finish the day? Um, and we found out that we could. We found that Monday and Tuesday is heavy. Most sweeping occurs ideally after trash days. So if you think of your neighborhoods and your, in your areas where there are heavy trash days or, or heavy leaf areas, that Monday, Tuesday, uh, Mount Vernon, Wren Street, uh, Oriole, the birds or in, in that area, um, we, we were able to internalize it. We very successful. Um, Norman Parks and Danny were able to win. The problem with, with internalizing some work is breakdowns mm -hmm. we, that we don't have to worry about when we have a contractor doing it. Um, 
When we do it, we have to worry about that machine breaking down. Um, is it up? Is there a driver available? Is he in, is he in today? Um, and we were very successful last season to the point where we've done it again this season. Um, and, it's, and it took some work. It, it, it takes a bit more management and a lot more work on CFM's case to stay on, the, mm -hmm. on, on those machines. But um, we're about to look into a new route this year that, that will uh, potentially add on to that, mm -hmm. internalizing um, and showing some more savings for next year. Great. Great. Uh, let me now recognize Councilor Kim Janey. Not Chris. <laughs> yes, not Chris. Kim, how are you? Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, just very responsive. Um, I've found that to be true just as a resident and certainly now as a counselor. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. want to um, just acknowledge your team on the panel, but also here. Uh, while I'm acknowledging folks, just a shout out for Eroy Kendall, who is doing amazing work in Roxbury and Dudley Square. Hope he's watching or maybe, well, he's not watching because he's doing the work, but maybe his mom, his family is watching. Um, I really appreciate the investment um, that is going to make our streets safer, uh, more walkable, easier to navigate for people who ride bikes, for our elderly, I think that is very important. As someone who does not own a car, that yeah. is a priority for me. I want to also acknowledge the advocates in the room for their good work and the work that you have been doing to push this um, forward. And so I'm glad to see the investment in this budget. Yeah. Also with the, the equity lens that you're using around some of the improvements, yeah. what I certainly know to be true, um, living uh, in my neighborhood, not everyone calls through online and for various reasons. We know that people don't call because they maybe perhaps believe that nothing will be done. You know, so there's, I think, a, a gap in terms of trust and whether or not the city will be responsive. Um, it has been my experience that you have been, so I, I do want to show my appreciation. Um, I'm hoping that you can talk about some of the projects in my district, uh, particularly Madison Park Village and what's happening on Quincy Street as yep. well. Bar, do you want to? Hi, Councillor. Madison Park Village, uh, the, the city streets in Madison Park, we should be starting construction very soon on that. Uh, and Quincy, I believe construction is about to start. We had a situation with the uh, private utilities that needs to be adjusted. Uh, so I believe that issue has been resolved now that the construction season is with us. We should be doing a groundbreaking and starting construction on that very soon. Okay, and how, are, how are neighbors notified when this happens? So I, I notice on Moreland Street, uh, National Grid is digging up the street all last summer, mm -hmm. continues now that spring is here to dig up the street. But I don't see a lot of notification going out to neighbors to inform them that they may have issues, you know, that they'll have to either detour when they're trying to either leave for work or, or come back home or if they are hosting something at their home and that there's going to be a challenge with parking, how were folks notified when these, pro the larger projects, but just sometimes the, the road work that's happening? Is that left to the companies? Is that the city? What happens? Uh, it really depends upon who's doing the work, but essentially under, and Katie, correct me, uh, basically the, there's a set of flyering that'll happen in advance to inform neighbors of work that is happening uh, on their block and the, sort of the duration, as well as give them information about where they can either find out more details or uh, find out who to contact. Um, it is certainly an area that we are always interested in figuring out if there are things we can do beyond the flyer uh, that uh, can help uh, inform residents. So we look at uh, sort of blasting information out uh, in collaboration with our Office of Neighborhood Services and are happy to sort of brainstorm with you about other ways we might be able to be effective at, at that. Yeah, I think that would be helpful because I have found that notification isn't going out, and I'm not sure that that is necessarily the city's fault, but just on a range of things that are yep. happening in neighborhoods that involve noise, um, that involve kind of rerouting, you know, cars or, or pedestrians, that people are not being given advance notice of this. Um, in terms of uh, Long Island Bridge, mm -hmm. where, where are we? 
with sure. the uh, negotiations uh, with the so town, I, I, Quincy? Park can speak in greater detail to this, but over the course of this year, the, the focus is really around design and permitting, and we've actually started that process. So uh, tomorrow uh, will be uh, sort of our a public hearing before the Boston Conservation Commission, which essentially will be a, 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 a presentation of the Boston Conservation Commission about the means and methods of construction uh, and as we take on the Long Island Bridge. That would then be followed up with uh, a similar conversation with the Quincy Conservation Commission. Uh, we would also be engaging uh, the state uh, and through the MEPA process, as well as the Coast Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers. Essentially, uh, that the, the local, uh, state, and federal entities that uh, would be the permitting authorities for the course of the bridge. As that is happening, as sort of this team is thinking about the design and construction method for the bridge, there's a separate part of the budget, um, the city's budget, which is looking at the actual planning and programming for the island, which. Uh, Marty Martinez is leading uh, and to think about what are the types of services uh, that we want to uh, provide to provide that sort of continuum of care uh, and really create a, a recovery campus on the island. So everyone who's watching and everyone in this room has heard the resistance. Are your, it's the city's position that this, that we'll just keep moving forward with the permitting and dealing with the state and whomever that we need uh, permits from and that things will move forward yep. uh, and we regardless are, uh, of resistance. Yep. We certainly want to engage our partners in Quincy. And similar to your last, uh, your last question, um, in any of our construction projects, uh, we always look to minimize any impact that it has on, on residents and be able to engage any impacted residents or constituents in that process. We'll certainly be doing that with our partners in Quincy uh, during the course of, uh, of this project. And so we look forward to having those conversations uh, in Quincy, conversations in Boston as, as this project moves forward. Okay, assuming everything moves forward smoothly, mm -hmm. uh, remind me of the, the projected date yeah. of completion. Uh, so we would expect to be able to uh, essentially build a bridge uh, within the next uh, three and a half years, which is what is sort of reflected in the capital budget here. Mm -hmm. And some, so I'm going to come back to the neighborhoods mm -hmm. now. So there is a street, um, Albert Street. It is borders the Alice Taylor housing development. Yep. And then on the other side is the Southwest Corridor with, uh, I think it's Ruggles Street Station right yep. there. No one is claiming responsibility for this street. Residents need to know that the street can be repaved, not just potholes fixed on occasion, but who's really responsible. And it seems that everyone is saying, not us. You know, whether you talk to the state, whether you talk to BHA, whether you talk to the city. Um, so it'd be helpful to get some clarity. My phone is not working fast enough for me to pull up this three book uh, Boston, which sort of can answer this exact question, but we will get back to you about sort of the ownership that. and responsibility. And then also for street lights. Yep. How, what, so is that you? There's a street light that's out that I've gotten a call about or is it, does that determine whether it's is it a, a city light or if it's like NSTAR? It'll depend a little bit on the ownership of the street okay. uh, but we can certainly look into the street light and we'll uh, sort of coordinate with you to uh, contact whoever the right, the right party is whether it's us or whether it's somebody else. Okay I can follow up offline. Yeah. Thank you. That's it for now. I'll wait for a second round. Thank, thank you. you. Councilor Asabi George. Thank you chair and thank you all for being here and of course uh, I think you'll hear the echoes of thanks to your team because they certainly uh, keep us informed of what's happening and a lot of our calls through our offices um, need to end up in your office. I have uh, a couple of questions about um, needle disposal. I know a year ago we talked about it. I'm, I'm wondering if your department has been trained and your employees have been trained sharps. in um, sharps disposal, proper sharps disposal. On that, the Public Health Commission takes the lead really with their sharps team. Um, so we will call them in when we, uh, uh, when we see, when there's a needle pickup that's needed. Great. And it, has there been any effort, though, to train? Because I know the BPL has done quite a bit of work around training their staff and having appropriate kiosks in their libraries. The Parks Department has done a pretty extensive staff training across uh, their department. And I'd hate to think that work is stopping while we're waiting for a needle to get picked up. So, so far to date, we've yet to start the training um, or implement it. We've talked to labor about it, our, our friends and AFSCME um, who oversee our labor unions. Um, there's been a little bit of pushback, I think rightfully so, as far as the safety concerns on the street. 
Um, the additional shops teams that you guys have helped fund have been very helpful. Um, the turnaround times have been, um, it, it hasn't stopped work. It's, it's, it's been, I called one, I called some in on the um, surface road behind the fence at uh, Blackstone Street with, it, with those um, compacts, I think they call it Postal 9. Um, 45 minutes they were there. I, I actually created a case um, to just kind of see, yeah. kind of test it. Um, it's been very helpful. Um, so as of right now, we've kind of kept it to the point where our folks are notifying 311. 311 has actually got a, they don't create a case, they actually make a phone call. They do a case that gets an email alert, but um, there's been good, uh, Rocco Cigliano, um, his team has been very good to be that conduit. Um, so to date, that system has worked. I'm always concerned, as are the um, labor unions, about that, just the handling of um, that material. Yep. No, it's certainly understandable. Um, I'm wondering about the impact, too, on any of the cleaning vehicles, especially as we take street cleaning um, more in-house, um, the impacts of sweeping up needles and, and the, cost of, the cost of that, because they are, I know that it's a concern for um, some of the authorities and private contractors. So, so it's a banned item at, the, at our transfer stations. Um, we had talked, I think, a bit back and forth on emails about how to find that information mm -hmm. in, that, in that waste stream. They don't quantify it. They don't have a, um, a percentage of, um, as it's not something that they're supposed to be able to handle. Um, so as of now, it hasn't been an issue. Um, but when it comes through the waste stream, what happens to them? I don't think it's seen. I think it's, pardon the pun, a needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's embedded with those. So, so when we dump those sweepers, we can have three and a half cubic yards of material, and that's that's been crushed and pulled together and compacted, um, put into a packer that's 20 yards. That's... 60 yards of trash compacted. Um, so we've yet, and I, I, I defer to Rob DeRosa, who, who's our contact with these transfer stations, but we have yet to get a call. We get calls on too much wood, too much plastic, too much, you know, uh, whatever um, different um, contaminant can be. We've yet to get a call on that. Um, I have to think it is getting through somehow, right? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's ending up both in the, the waste stream through garbage, but then also with street sweepers. So, pulling them up and then just, I don't know how those so are that's by, of. So, so when I say that, um, that three and a half yards of that hopper, if you will. Yep. Those are the, so, so those sweepers dump into the back of a packer. That's that 20 yard packer. Uh, that packer goes, yeah, so. And then what about with waste disposal, garbage, household trash? If it's seen um, by our contractors, we get alerted, we alert our, um, our shops team. So mm -hmm. it's yet and to see. And then are we measuring it all? It ended up in um, with the, you know, it goes into the back, of, it's in household trash. Yeah. It goes into the back of a dump truck. So if it's there, we don't touch it. Yep. We get the shops, and so shops should be able to But if you don't it. see it, I'm saying it's in the trash yeah. bag. Is there any, is there any data on it, the amount of needles that yeah. are ending up in the regular I called that transfer waste. station on Howard Street that we use, um, and they weren't able to get any type of guesstimate even. Mm -hmm. um, and again, is, it being a banned item, they would pull the chute, if you will, call time out. Um, so it's tough to find that number we don't see embedded in a bag. Yeah, I think that to some uh, cities that have done it have done a waste sort. Audit, yeah. Then audit, yep. I guess, to, to find out the number. I, I do see with the waste removal uh, line uh, 525200, there's an increase um, in the garbage waste removal line. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that increase? It's, it's pegged to CPI. Uh, it's pegged to the Consumer Price Index. So okay. we basically inflated it by the, the Consumer Price Index for this coming year. Okay, and then w where are we in the length of our contract yep. um, with waste? So 13 more months, I think, is, is the official, 13 and a half more months. July 1, 19 will be our next 15 year, uh, I'm sorry, five year oh, yeah. contract. And where, do we have an option to just immediately renew or? I, I believe that it, there, are, there are always ways to um, negotiate um, extensions. It's been, it's been done in the past, but I think because of the um, yard waste conversation, we're proud of the 18 weeks but we're pushing for 20 weeks, and in this new contract, we can get to that 20. There's a few other things we want to try out and um, kind of tighten the belt financially and mm -hmm. also with some of the waste streams, so. Is, that, is that, are we seeing an increase in the cost of dump uh, recycling? Yes. And, yeah. and how's that impacting? So, so we, we haven't seen it yet. We have a $5 floor price that was uh, written into the last contract. Um, that has done us very well, um, but, the, the, but the market as a whole has gone up. Um, so we've yet to see that hit us yet, um, but we're, we're planning for it and expecting it in this mm -hmm. next contract. Great. All right. It's, my clock is going gonna, gonna to buzz in a second, so I'll save the rest for the next round. Thank you. Council McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and welcome, everybody. Um, I don't want to go through the whole list of thanks because you start getting yourself in trouble, but <laughs> <I know. clears throat> I'll just go through the people that, like, 
uh, I'm dealing with on a, on a regular basis. Uh, Eric, especially, uh, is always there, available to take my call. Uh, and so is Mike, and I appreciate that. Uh, Robbie, uh, and then Mark uh, Cotterelli, of course, is chasing utilities around. It's funny because one of my good friends works for the utility, and every time I say Mark's a good friend of mine, he goes, he just cringes. He can't believe it because he uh, he is he's great on your team. He's like he's like Brad Marchand. You want him on your team, but you don't want him on the other team. Um, and it's great to have him there. And then uh, Power and Zach, you know, thank you for everything you've done in uh, District Five in particular. Um, we have a very busy couple of years coming up in District 5, and uh, I certainly appreciate that. And then Aaron, who always takes my call and, uh, and keeps you guys on time, which is nice. <laughs> um, I'm really happy with uh, going over this budget uh, simply because I think that this administration has recommitted themselves to the capital plan, you know, what people see outside the front door, um, and that's important. Uh, in High Park, between the Dane Ave Bridge, Dane Ave and High Park Ave intersection, Cleary Square intersection, Walcott Square, uh, Rosnell Village just was repainted um, and re resurfaced, you know, and we have the bus, the bus lane pilot, which has been an incredible success, you know. Some people lost it. I had a lady from Randolph call me and said she wasn't happy that she lost her parking space because she parks there to walk to Forest Hills. I didn't care. Um, <laughs> But ultimately, the bus pilot program has been, the bus lane has been an incredible uh, positive and a lot of moving parts. And so I thank you, uh, Chief, as well as, uh, as BTD and everybody who's been involved in that uh, every single morning. And then Mattapan, you continue work for uh, working in, in, um, in Mattapan Square. And I know that in, soon we'll be talking about the reconstruction of Mattapan Square and the possible redesign and how to reactivate that, um, that district. Um, I'm incredibly happy with everything that's going on uh, in the Public Works Department. It's not because I used to be a Public Works guy. I think that um, you've stayed on top of everything that you need to stay on top of. The feedback uh, that we get between uh, people picking up the trash, people throwing away the trash, uh, the Main Street business districts. Uh, you know, we lost Vinnie Provenzano, which was a huge loss, but, you know, Freddie and the guys and everybody's still they're doing a nice job in Cleary Square and in all of the Main Street districts. So. They're doing a really good job. I, I can't really, uh, I really have nothing but positive things to say. Uh, the only line that concerned me was that th those benches, um, benches bring people. Hmm. Just want to let you know, sometimes the people that aren't welcomed, um, we've had benches <coughs> removed, uh, especially in the, yes. in the Main Street Business District where uh, people uh, congregate um, and then it, sometimes there's issues. So as many benches as you can put in, sometimes you're putting benches out. So it's more just a heads up. I'm good with benches in District 5. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. Council Romali. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mike, Chris, and Tara. Thank you. You guys have done an amazing job and really <coughs> set the tone. Freddie Mycroft, the best. Tony Harris, all-star. Eric Prentice, creme de la creme. April Maldonado, perfect. Mark Cartarelli, none better. And that's just some of the names that have been so <laughs> responsive to me and my team. Um, I think snow removal in this past season was the best I have seen in eight years on this body. And we had some challenging storms. We had three nor'easters. Um, what was different <laughs> this year compared to prior years? Mike. So uh, I think it's another year of a team tightening things up and yeah. plans just getting a little bit better in place. Council McCarthy can tell you how snow goes. It's, it's, it goes and then you react. I think uh, folks like Nolan Parks, um, Danny Nee, and Darlene Williams um, think about, we think about snow 12 months of the year. Yeah. But leading into a snowstorm, I think that the ability to get the snowblowers, if I could highlight something um, in, in this budget, we're asking for a third snowblow. We have, we have, we have our three main routes, if you will. Uh, main routes are, are our major thoroughfares, our Dodd Aves, Hyde Park Aves, Blue Hill Aves. We were able to put those snowblowers on the roads inside the snow event. So it's still snowing two or three, four hours left. We think it's dissipating enough to st start focusing. We bring in trailer trucks um, and we blow snow. Um, and it's, 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 it's fresher snow, there's, there's, there's less debris in it, there's less household trash in it. Um, it's more like that tarmac snow that all the, all the airports deal with, it's nice and clean. Um, we did Broadway, um, we start, so w w with those two blowers, we're able to implement, we did Bennington Street. Um, getting the snow removed was, was this those, the first year that we had those two nope, snowblowers? No, it's it's, it was the first year that we really had the volume. You need volume. Yeah. yeah I mean, you know, you need, I don't want volume, um, but for the blowers, you need volume. Yeah. Um, and, and it allowed us to kind of get into a quicker cleanup mode inside the event to, 
to, to remove snow inside of a snowstorm, I think is pretty impressive. Um, I agree. It's not pushing, it's taking away. We can't take these things down, Crescents and Ravens and Wren Streets and these different streets in, in, in all of your districts, but we can make a difference <laughs> on the Do you major. remember a couple of years ago when on the small street, it was not under LaGrange. all of your administration, yeah. it killed a house, so, uh, but did. I do, do appreciate that. Um, luckily, he was a city employee, the person who lived in the house, so he gave us a little bit of a, a pass. Um, so the request is for an additional snow blower yep. this year. I mean, that, that seems to be a no-brainer. Um, and then... It was done so well. I think the coordination, particularly with parks, as we had these nor'easters, and I would venture guess more more down trees, yeah. certainly in my time on this body and in many, many years. Um, how, and I know, Chief, you do a great job as sort of, in addition to being the Chief of Streets, acting commissioner, is there, what, how is the process to find the permanent commissioner? <laughs> have, uh, or what's the timeline on that? I mean, there's sort of a, a sort of separate set of conversations. I think one of the things, uh, I mean, I appreciate you Compliment, really, the fact is the compliment is to the, the team around me. Um, they are the ones who are able to provide so much of that leadership, so much of that work uh, that, that actually gets done. We can have certainly a, a sort of a separate conversation around that timeline. That's sort of a separate, uh, a separate piece. Okay, fair enough. I, I, won't, I won't push it, but um, I think, you know, we obviously have some great people on board, and, and I, I hope mm -hmm. that there's some strong internal candidates when that happens. Um, Let's talk a little bit about, I think, I think both Councilor Sabi George and Councilor McCarthy talked about, so the Casella contract is up next year. Yes. Um, have, you know, generally from the men and women I talk to in the yards seem pretty happy with them, a good, good working relationship. I love the idea of expanding yard waste by even more, two more weeks. Um, but how, um, you know, what are some conversations, I know we can't get into sort of negotiations at this point, but sort of general conversations on what we want to see out of the next contract, if Cassell is able to work with us, some sort of thoughts on what you all want to see. So most of that right now is happening through what's called the, the Zero Waste Advisory Commission, yeah. um, and our next meeting is on July 16th uh, in the Piemonte Room. Uh, over the course, as Mike said, over the course of this year, uh, we basically are looking at what are ways in which we can uh, either increase recycling uh, or reduce the amount of... What's the recycling waste? rate now? We're at 21%. 21%. Yep. What were we 10 years ago? Oh, we've gone up significantly. But yeah, it's, I, I, I would say around 16%. Yeah. Rob, is that fair to say? 11%. 11 yeah. so, and, and, and that was prior to single stream recycling. Yep. Right? Yeah. That was, single stream recycling was the last big um, yeah. bump. Yeah. yeah. Still pretty low, though. 21%. So the, uh, the really, in many ways, the reason we're doing the zero waste uh, work is really to think about how do we either increase that 21% number or reduce the denominator, reduce the amount of, of waste that we're putting in. So that's really a credit to sort of Rob, Brian, and Jerry, uh, who are uh, sort of uh, staffing that and putting their, their ideas into this process so that as we think about what that next bid looks like, or the next RFP looks like, we can sort of put in place, as Mike said, some of the programs we think are going to have a big, big impact. And is curbside compost part of that conversation to get to zero or lower so the... One of the pieces the that... Uh, there's sort of three categories that we are sort of looking yeah. at. New services, new rules, and sort of different outreach. In that new services category, we certainly are looking at composting in general. Um, it is a significant portion, probably about 20% of what actually ends up sort of in the trash based on some previous waste audits. So there's a huge opportunity with compost. Um, whether it is... That's huge because I would venture a guess that most houses have incinerators. Right. I mean, certainly... So people just don't use them? Whether it is the absence of incinerators in some areas or not, uh, not a familiarity with using them or... Uh, uh, or a preference not to. Yeah. I mean, there, there could be a bunch of reasons why that's the case. One of the things that is a big focus for us essentially is thinking about that slice of the waste pie. How yeah. do we actually think about addressing that? And whether that means uh, expansions of something like a Project Oscar, a different type of service, a curbside service, all those are the sort of things. I, I love doing. the, I'm sorry to cut you off, I just no, want to get through a couple of these. I love the concept of Project Oscar. Nobody uses it. So I, I think. We want to make yep. it easier for folks to do it. I, I think, you know, yep. In, in Jamaica Plain, you've seen in, in Hyde Park and Rosdale and West Park, particularly in JP, it's where it started, yep. and I'm sure other neighborhoods as well. I'm, I'm, focused on, I'm more focused on Southwest Boston. Um, you see great local industrious individuals who have started curbside compost pickup, and they are thriving. Yes. I would venture a guess Bostonians who do compost would be willing to pay a small fee for some um, uh, curbside compost pickup. So we could make it cost neutral, actually save money because of the significant waste yep. stream. So. You know, Councilor Presley and I, for years, have been talking about um, 
piloting a curbside compost, looking at what happened in Cambridge. They piloted in a small neighborhood. It was yep. so successful it expanded. I, I will still push for that in the weeks ahead as we get up to, up to our budget. So I, I think, again, I don't mean to minimize Project Oscar. It's no, a great step, uh, but we have three, I believe, in the entire city. There's one in Jamaica Plain. No one even knows. There's six in Jamaica Plains? There's, no, there's six oh. total. Oh, six but, total. I'm but sorry. You're absolutely, I, I don't disagree with your sort of fundamental yep. point that there's, there are other services we need to provide if we want to yep. get more of the population. Perfect. Um, briefly, can you talk a little bit about Hyde Square um, and sort of the redesign and, and the work around there? Yeah, maybe power. It's almost done. Yeah. Council, I think we are almost done with Hyde Square. There may be a little bit of work that's left. And Public what area. we are looking forward to is the integration of the public art project, which I believe you have been extremely supportive and championing, Absolutely. Councillor. It so should be this fall, right? It should be. And how many trees How many trees were removed and how many new trees were planted? Uh, Do you know I, offhand? No, Councillor, I, I should, but I don't. I know I more were planted than removed, so that's a good thing. That's always the case. That's what we, that's what we strain for. Okay, thank you uh, for this round. But again, honestly, you, you I think... DPW is um, is one of the best run departments by far in the city, and I'm so so grateful for all of your work, people here, and most importantly, people who are out doing the work right now. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, and we've uh, since been joined by City Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty. Just a quick follow up on the recycling, the 21 percent. Do we have any data by neighborhood? What neighborhoods are better at recycling than others? Uh, we would have some data by route, but not by neighborhood. The routes don't exactly follow neighborhood boundaries. Okay. Is that fair? Yes. Right. I think it would be interesting if we could track that, because I would venture to say my neighborhood is probably a lower <laughs> recycling because we have all those brownstones in apartments uh, versus um, you know West Roxbury with more single twos and threes anyway. Um, Chair recognizes Councilor Frank Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, everybody. What is Project Oscar? So Project Oscar are uh, a set of uh, sort of composting sites where residents can take uh, their food scraps to a particular location. Uh, we do have one which is actually right outside of City Hall, uh, right adjacent to the patio. Uh, there is one in East Boston, one in Brighton. And what is it, just a drop-off? Just a drop-off site. And uh, then who handles it after that? So then we will, we will cart that, uh, the food scraps to... Uh, to somebody who basically will take take the food scraps and, and repurpose them. Does it cost us anything? There is a cost associated with it. It's largely in the hauling. Okay. And, and um, so my big thing with the with the composting, if we choose to go composting, which I think we're going to need to choose to go composting in the next couple of years, is to is to see how we as a city we have qualified you know intelligent people here. How, how do we how do we do that ourselves and not and not have more contractors in the city, more contractors that we have to deal with. I know that that seems to, to be what people want to do, just all contractors. We yeah. shy away from actually hiring people to do the work that we should be, we should be doing. So, I, I mean, I really think we should be looking at something where we're handling it ourselves, and if, and if, and if we started smaller, smaller trucks, more routes, um, I, I think we, we can do it. If New York City's doing it to some degree, we can certainly do it. Uh, I actually visited a, a Red Hook in New York City, and they have a they have a fabulous compost um, whole program going on there, run by run by mostly um, well, it's a public private partnership, but it's a lot of volunteers there, and it's attached to a community garden. It really seems to work well, and they get their compost from people dropping off at commuter commuter stations, at train stations. They they come in and they. There's a, there's a, you know, people there. It's not just drop this here. There's actual people there and telling them why it's important to compost, where the compost is going, that sort of stuff. Um, Para, can we talk about Long Island a little bit? Does, does, what does Quincy have? Do they need to sign off on any permits for this bridge? Councillor, we are going to be submitting what we call a notice of intent with the Quincy Conservation Commission. That okay. is just good practice. From the get-go councillor, we are always being extremely respectful for all environmental issues, and we've taken the position to design this bridge so that its means and methods of construction is as least intrusive or least impact to any environmental issues. That being said, because some of the bridge is within the Quincy territorial waters. We will be going to the Quincy Conservation Commission and demonstrating to them that the method which we have chosen will be as least impact as possible. So just the Quincy Conservation? 
Quincy Conservation Commission, Commission, Boston Conservation Commission. No, but I mean, I'm talking just Quincy. That's that's their own. Yes. That's their bite at the apple, right there. Yes. And, and and there's a set of uh, requirements, and it's and it's all environment. We're not going to be talking about traffic on Dorchester no. Street there. No, Councillor, the the focus in our conversation with the Quincy Conservation Commission is the impact to resource areas within the construction area. Okay. Um, and how many how many of those supports are in Quincy Quincy uh, water or area? About half the bridge, councillor. Half the bridge. Yes, coincidentally, about half the bridge is in Quincy. Okay, and and what's going to need to what type of work's going to need to be performed on those structures? So, is there extensive work to happen there, or they? No. Uh, councillor, as I said earlier, the means and methods of construction is specifically structured so there's minimum impact to the piers that are within the main watershed because we are floating the bridge and using the tides installing it. However, within the land interaction between Moon Island and the very first pier, mm -hmm. that bit of bridge requires work which is going to be physically within the Quincy shoreline. Okay. So therefore, it is proper need for us. Sign off on that, it is on that proper counselor for us to seek their... And, uh, and is do we have any team communicating with Quincy right now? We've certainly uh, done some outreach with Quincy and look forward to having both sort of those formal conversations through the Quincy. So that's plan. a no? Yeah, that's moving. It's a no? Oh, no, we do. Yes, we have conversations with Quincy. With who? Uh, so our team has been having some conversations. Who's your team? Uh, through our IGR office. We've been having some conversations. With okay. Um, and, and in this budget, is, is, is the cost of the whole bridge in this budget? So yes. the 90 however many million is in this budget right here. Yep. So we'll be fully funded. We won't have to come back next year for another 30 million or? Right, the money, the money so that is in is this budget. Over the next three years, exactly. councillor. So it's, so it's in, say, 30 million this year, 30 million next year, 30 million the year after. Yep. Yeah, we can get to the exact numbers for fiscal year by fiscal year, but okay. the so intent is that what, what is in this capital budget covers the entire construction Yes, councillor. Okay, good, good, thank you. Um, uh, Chris, will you talk a little bit about the emerald necklace? Like, what is the, uh, what's the plan? Yep. Is it is it just bike lanes down Columbia Road or, or uh, in painted painted bike lanes? What what is the plan with that? Is yep. there any sort of beautification that's going to happen? So, uh, the sort of the notion of Columbia Road and the redesign of Columbia Road is part of the broader Imagine Boston plan. It was one of the specific projects that was called out. The money in the budget here is money that really sort of starts that, frankly, real community process of figuring out what do the what are the residents in that corridor really most want to see in that street? Um, how much of that is additional green space or bike infrastructure or bus infrastructure or parking? I mean, what what should we actually be doing with the Columbia uh, Road corridor? Um, some of that work is being done in collaboration with our partners at Livable Streets and Stacey Thompson, uh, as well as a number of uh, local neighborhood organizations. So the money here essentially is to sort of create that broader plan that answers your specific questions around what, what should that look like? So, so the, the Olmstead had an actual plan for that whole thing, it, it, so it's not going to be Olmstead's plan. It, we're going to... Uh, no, we're, we're, we're sort, of, sort of taking that notion that that sort of completion of bringing the Emerald Necklace sort of back to the Boston Harbor yep. is sort of part of conceptually what we want to do, but we want to sort of make sure that all the residents are engaged in that process and are giving us some direction about what it should look like. Okay. Um, the the waste contracts. How much? Forty two million for waste contract. Is that is that is that um, household waste and recycling? Yep. Forty all all in. And I see on the on the list of, of contracts above a hundred thousand is there's multiple. I can't see it. It's like four point type. I don't know if that's on purpose or not. But um, we've got purchase America capital waste. Yep. Like how many companies are in? Uh, is it is it one umbrella company and they and they subcontract? How does it, why do we have multiple contracts there for the for the waste? We purchase America at Sunrise. Yes, right. And so Sunrise and Capital are the ones who basically do a lot of the curbside pickup. Okay. Um, I believe you'll also see contracts in there for the sites that we actually take that waste to, uh, and then you'll see a another contract in there for Casella, as was mentioned before, which is the group that actually takes our recycling. So all those pieces, that contract comes up with that 40 yeah, million. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as far as recycling, um, how much does it, uh, what's, the, what's the cost, the, the tipping cost on recycling now? As Mike said, sort of those, we have a, a sort of a ceiling of $5 per ton. We will be charged at most $5 per ton under the current terms of our because contract. Because they are able to sell that? 
uh, that was essentially what was negotiated. Uh, and then if, if the price of the commodity actually sort of becomes positive, there's a way in which the city actually, as has, it, has, it, has, has happened in the past years, we actually would get some revenue from it. But we don't expect that during the course of this year. Have we thought about okay. offering Frank, recycling to restaurants Consulate. at all, Chris, like cardboard <laughs> recycling? Uh, I think up. we've solely focused Last on question. resin. And I think we're actually maybe even limited by ordinance. statute, ordinance. by ordinance, yeah. in okay. doing that. So we, we actually are focused solely by ordinance on residences. OK, we can get back into that. Will you try? Uh, 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 OK, well, I'll come back. I'm sorry. That's OK. <laughs> Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Council CMO. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for being here. I also would like to recognize the great work of your staff, especially Mr. Prentice and Mr. Mr. Nee as well. Um, one program I think is very effective is the, is the Hokies doing a lot of work across the city. Um, I know, unfortunately, they're only there for a certain period of time, um, certain months. How can we, the program is working so well, but how can we expand it to include it for, for a longer period of time. Sure, so we've actually started that. Um, the, the, the seasonal hokey is, a, is for a, um, a window, five month window. Right now you have a gentleman named Sean McColgan who does great work for you on uh, Broadway and um, Preble and Andrew Square. Um, those months where we don't have the seasonal, um, actually under the leadership of Danny Nee and Norman Parks, we actually take a um, MEO, motor equipment operator, or a, or a heavy motor equipment operator who, who is not f uh, filling a different role and they're, and they're working as a hokey. There's a uh, gentleman by the name of Steve Norton mm -hmm. um, and sometimes Chris Lynch who, is, who, are, who are able to do that work on, on your stretches. Um, and also we just transferred over a couple more individuals. Eric Mello is another one who was, who was able to pick up that uh, task. So, so we've started that work in every district and in, and in every neighborhood where that hokey system doesn't just come with a seasonal tag. Obviously in the winter we have to wear multiple hats and priorities kind of get back to streets, making streets safe um, and some other work, but but we're trying to expand that program now, where it doesn't just have a seasonal name to it, and it, you know, a seasonal individual, um, it has a permanent role and task. And I I do enjoy when I when I'm in the neighborhoods talking talking to them, and they're very professional and hardworking. Um, did have an opportunity to work with Eric Prentice as well. Uh, we're trying to get. Um, there's a Hokey now in Chinatown that's doing a lot of a lot of yep. work doing some great work there. Um, there's one street in particular, Oxford oh, no. Street, I am concerned with. I know Public Works is going to work harder and do a better job on Oxford Street. Um, are, there, are there certain streets in Boston that don't get, um, don't get cleaned because of how narrow they are? No, um, and, and we do put a lot of time and attention to places like Oxford Place. Um, the better job is a consistent job that's done. We, what, we're, what we're doing is sending code enforcement um, to help us out. Uh, four years ago, this body gave us code enforcement. Um, they were underneath um, ISD's purview and responsibility. In that time, we've been able to better deploy um, the 17 officers, men and women, um, of code enforcement. I think you might have talked to Director Steve Tankle and some others. Um, Oxford Place is going to become something that's part of, quote, uh, Steve's morning initiatives. Um, that can be areas of East Boston or South Boston, if the case may be. And um, at this place, um, Oxford, um, Oxford Place, it's become a dumping ground, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, the um, grocery store on Oxford Street does a, does a, does a really good job um, of, of, of power washing their stretch. It's that Oxford Place has become a problem. It's, and it's less the size of it. It's more the nature of those illegal dumpings that occur. Um, but 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 it's but it's been on our radar. It's now on our radar with a with a with a um, code enforcement presence, so we can kind of better manage what we show up to, rather yeah. than it being a, as I think you've seen um, a large scale dumping site. Yeah, I'm on Oxford Street in Oxford Place yep. at least once a week. Oxford Street does need to be cleaned better. Um, Oxford Place has a lot of issues that the water and sewer could be helpful on as well a lot of sewage um, backup on Oxford Place. Um, but having a better public works presence on Oxford Street and Oxford Place would be, would be helpful. I, I was down there last week and it was just in, Oxford Place was just in terrible shape. Um, there were needles everywhere. There was um, trash everywhere. Um, and there were young people playing in that area on that street. Um, so I communicated many times with, with your staff, but over the summer, I want to make sure that that's a top priority for public works as well. 
both both Oxford Street and Oxford Place, and also Chinatown in general. It's it's so tiny, but there's a lot of restaurants around. We we may need to do PSAs with restaurant owners on how to take out the trash and when trash is going to be picked up. Um, some of those issues, if I could work with your staff on, but I. I think it's critical. There's a there's a rodent problem over there as well. There's just a lot of quality of life issues that um, that need to be addressed. Is this something you're willing to work with me most on? Most certain, yeah. yeah, most certain. As it relates to um, downtown crossing, um, I know there's going to be some money in the budget for design improvements, Washington Street, Summer Street, Winter Street intersections. Um, any any updates on that? It's one, probably the busiest area in the city. There's millions of tourists that come to that area, Freedom Trail, every day. We just need to make sure it, um, it's in good shape. Any any updates? Yep. So uh, Katie and her team have had a number of conversations with the uh, downtown crossing bid, mm -hmm. uh, and we are prioritizing essentially putting together a design for that Washington winter summer uh, intersection, ideally over the course of this year. Uh, as well as looking at School Street, uh, to your points, for the area where the Freedom Trail uh, comes down that has a number of areaway issues. And the idea is that we'll be able to take that design and reconnect with the, with the bid team and understand, is this something that the city can do itself, the city can do in collaboration with the bid, uh, or have the bid be able to participate in some other way? There was, a, there was a barrel taken off the corner of L Street and Broadway on next to Starbucks, if we can follow up on that one. I got an email on it yesterday. Any updates on um, the upcoming meeting on stray voltage? I know there probably needs to be some type of long-term study on what the city can and what the city can't do, including PSA announcements, but I know we're gonna have a formal hearing on that, but any, any guidance that you guys want to accomplish at that meeting? So the street lighting team in the past has, has looked at the straight voltage issue, and I think what we'll be able to talk through at, our, at the session on Friday is looking at some of those ideas that have come up before in terms of either outreach or investment uh, or sort of a comprehensive study of our street lighting assets. So uh, with John Yetman and Joe Sullivan and Mike Donaghy, we'll be able to go through those options with you. Okay. And, um, both, both of those gentlemen have done a good job of um, staying in, in contact with yes. me and my office, and they are, they are helpful. I got a call recently from the South End, um, Allen Rohan Square. Yep. It's part of um, Public Works. I think the park is overgrown. Um, there's some vandalism, vandalism throughout the area. Is this something you could follow up on? Yep, we'll, we'll do that. Um, then finally, I'd, I'd like to take a look at the uh, workforce, workforce of your department, and I, I noticed 3% of the employees are Asian. Is that where you guys want to be? Uh, certainly we want our, our entire department to reflect uh, the diversity of the city, and it's a big priority of our HR team led by Trish Casey. So we're happy to work with you. If, there's, if there's outreach efforts that uh, you think we should be engaged in, we're, we're more than willing to, to do that. Yeah, right. I think we need to increase, um, increase it more than 3%. Yeah. I agree. I think that part of what we are very interested in doing is figure out how we actually recruit from uh, the entirety of the city so that our entire department really really reflects uh, our city and draws from the strengths of our entire, uh, our entire residential population. How are you going to do that? So that is a focus of uh, the city as a whole through our chief diversity officer, uh, as well as the work of our HR team led by Trish Casey. So a lot of it has to do with how we uh, sort of promote uh, the work that we, uh, the job opportunities we have in the city of Boston through platforms like the Boston uh, Career Center, which is the online portal. Part of it has to do with how we uh, are present at career fairs. Uh, and separate from our own uh, work in sort of recruiting our staff, there's also a lot of work that Anne, among others, has done to think about how we actually recruit uh, people to respond to some of the RFP opportunities, the contractual opportunities that this department has, again, so that we can really make sure that uh, the entirety of the city I uh, really can participate. And if I could help out on that effort, please let me know. We certainly have a growing population, Asian population in the city, um, including Vietnamese in, in Dorchester and Chinese in Alston and Brighton as well, yep. including Chinatown. Uh, so I think it's important to try to do a better job of bringing more Asians, Asians on board. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Um, so I echo the comments of my, my, com uh, my colleagues. Uh, I start off honestly thanking you for all the work you've done um, and also the orientation and help you gave me as a newcomer to the city council. Um, in many cases, you knew more about uh, the district, our rhythms, and, and how uh, we move in District 1 than I did. And uh, to your credit, thank you both for sitting down with me at length and, and helping me understand how I can be an even better city councilor. So I just wanted to put that out there. Also to thank individually um, the folks who have been really helpful and responsive, um, Clarence Perkins, Joe Blazo, Ty Jackson, Eric Prentice, and of course, Michael, you've been incredible and been able to answer all my cell phone uh, calls and inquiries, um, no matter the time, actually, and honestly, uh, with, with thorough uh, follow-up and really being very helpful. So thank you so much. Um, Para, you were uh, excellent in helping to <laughs> orient me about the bridges and the timing. And so a lot of my questions are going to be just about timing, bridges, and what we, we kind of already talked about before in the district. Um, and then some, some honest, some clarification about what's going on. Um, I'll start with um, the, the toughest issue or the, the biggest confusion I get the most questions about, which is the Alfred Street Bridge and what's happening over there. Um, there a lot of people felt we already finished uh, and, and the bridge, and then now there's going to be... So just help, yep. help us understand what happened. So uh, Alfred Street Bridge Councilor, you are right. We just got through building that bridge about two and a half years ago, and uh, unfortunately, the bridge decks, the four parts that go up and down, they are experiencing premature um, <clears throat> failure. And so there has been extensive conversations between the city and the Mass, Depart Mass Department of Transportation. The, they were the agency that built the bridge on our behalf, including the contractor. Good news is that those conversations have resulted in a collective understanding that those four leaves need to be replaced mm -hmm. because we can't have a bridge of that nature. Uh, these conversations have been at the highest level at Mass DOD and the contractor. Uh, game plan counselor is that starting late summer, around September or thereabouts, counselor, we will start replacing the two inbound leaves of the bridge and hopefully that work will be finished by December. Mm -hmm. Throughout that time period, all traffic will be on one side of the bridge. Once that work has been done, we will shift all traffic to the out, you know, we'll just switch mm -hmm. the sides. And uh, not hopefully, we are hoping to finish the work by May of next year. We are impressing upon the contractor to do double shifts to work around the clock, not around the clock, counselor, that would be three shifts, double shifts, to ensure that we minimize the inconvenience because uh, we have reached out to the Everett Chamber of Commerce and our counterparts in the city of Everett and the large abutters that might be coming to the area mm -hmm. to ensure that the inconvenience is as minimum as possible, but it's an awkward situation. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. So. Uh, a lot of us were just a little, we thought, because there's so much happening in our district, as you know, District 1 seems to get, right now we have, I don't know, three, four, five bridges all being constructed. We have uh, so much with the traffic and the tunnel. We just finished Central Square. So there's been a lot on our on our shoulders. And so to, to think one was done and then to turn around and to have to do it again. Um, but since we're on the topic of bridges, uh, I know we have, um, the McArdle Bridge in East Boston has, has been budgeted at $3.9 million. That's the bridge from, the first bridge from on Meridian Street yes. into Chelsea. And so what, what's, the, what's the time frame and what's the goal? So that bridge also, Councillor, uh, it was rehabilitated mm -hmm. some years back, about 10 plus years ago. Councillor, whenever we use the word rehabilitated, that means the whole bridge is not replaced. It is just the broken parts at, that, at a given point in time. Uh, we are discovering that it still needs more attention. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping that the type of repairs that needs to be done will be as least intrusive as possible, meaning disruption to the traffic. There might be times where we may have to shut traffic a little bit, but not mass scale. How is that I'm going to coordinate 
with the bridges or with the already the boats that come through they the two bridges don't talk to each other right now I, I understand this is also part Chelsea needs to be at the table but this is it's it's hard enough uh, to get across that bridge on a good day sometimes if, if a little boat comes through and you won't we'll have traffic all the way down Meridian into almost by the post office into Maverick Square it could be that bad so just how are we going to coordinate that so the two bridges which are the Chelsea Street Bridge which is currently under the ownership of the State Department of Transportation mm -hmm. and the Chelsea Street, I'm sorry, the McArdle Bridge which is under the city's uh, ownership. The perennial issue of those two bridges needing to talk to each other is something which we have noted. There are community sure. members who have also pointed it out. I believe there may have been multiple initiatives to bring all stakeholders together which would be the State Department of Transportation, City of Chelsea, City of Boston, and other interest parties to see if, that, if something can be done to uh, collectively manage the situation without the situation managing us. So. And I'll, I'll just stay on the topic of bridges. How am I on time? I have a couple more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so could you give us an update on the, um, the North End Bridge? Uh, Not Washington State. Yes, <laughs> uh, or the Charlestown Bridge, whichever whichever side of uh, my district wants to blame the other one for <laughs> the bridge. So. Um, uh, just again, clarification, making sure it's clear on the record. We will continue to have a left turn coming off of that bridge onto Commercial. Am I correct? I believe so, Council. Okay, and so that was one of the biggest concerns that. Um, came to our office yes. was that there had been some discussion or someone had mentioned that the left-hand turn was going to be taken away. That is not true. That is not true, Councillor. So per the contract documents, the left-turn lane was allowed, so there may have been something lost in the translation, and we'll just keep it at that. Okay. Uh, something lost in the translation. Very, very, fair enough. As far as the bridge itself is concerned, Councillor, the State Department of Transportation, who is managing the construction on the city's behalf, should be giving a notice to proceed. That is the official transfer mm -hmm. point between the administrative process and the contractor. That should be coming up fairly soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, we are looking at a five to six year time horizon. Again, nothing to be gained by delaying this unnecessarily. So our desire is to get in and get out quickly. But unfortunately, this, unlike the weekend job which we did, is going to take a few months, few years. Can you give me the month this summer that we're going to start? So uh, at the very initial phase, Councillor, a lot of the work will be to readjust the utilities that are on that bridge. Basically, we are trying to rebuild a bridge around a series of utilities. Mm -hmm. And those utilities need to be adjusted. So for the better part of this year, you may not see actual bridge work, but we uh, when I say we, the State Department, State Department of Transportation uh, is working towards starting that utility relocation adjustment work uh, early this summer. Early this summer, okay. And the current lane configuration, which is one lane leading away from the city and mm -hmm. two lanes coming into the city should be maintained at least for this better part of this year, Council. At least for this year, that's... That's what you should be seeing. As I understood that that's, we're always going to have yes, that. Yes, always. At least one and then and the two. only reason I'm saying it that mannerism counselor, in situations of this nature, the contractor has the right to propose other means of doing this project that can make it better or faster. So we, uh, we have been advised that the contractors selected mm -hmm. are looking into matters of that nature. So we need to give it the due diligence of evaluation to ensure that by trying to do something good on one side doesn't sort of make things more challenging on somewhere else. Okay. I'll wait till the next round. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to, to thank the superintendent uh, for the great work that uh, you and your team did this year on snow removal. Um, anytime we had to reach out, uh, you were super responsive as were your team. So, and I know you had a front row seat from a couple of years ago. Uh, with respect to the accumulation, so this was probably a bag of shells, but nonetheless, it was a challenge, um, and I appreciate that. Same with the trash collection. I know you've been on that. Um, there was a time uh, when, on trash collection day, the streets would actually be dirty, the flinging of the barrels and the excess stuff on the barrels. It seems like the, uh, whether it's this contract you know, or it's uh, the, the mandate or directive from, from you, uh, they seem to be, uh, trash collectors seem to be doing a much better job making sure that the trash goes from the barrel into the truck and 
So the flinging and the discarding is seen to be, it's, it's at a minimum. Um, I did notice though trash collection, at least the, I don't know if it's the contract that went up 1.186645. Uh, if you can just maybe state what yeah. that's all about, just given that I'm figuring that more people as they start that's to recycle, mm -hmm. um, that, that those costs would start to go down. So I don't know if it were in the last year of our contract, when's the contract up, that type of stuff. So, so the contract's up on July 1st or June 31st of, um, 2019 that actually increases just um, simply the CPI adjusted every year okay. yeah um, okay. we are seeing a little bit of trash volume go away we're down 1% on trash um, that's I think can be market driven um, packaging driven uh, Brian Coughlin and Jerry Goldman and Rob DeRosa do a, do a very good job of keeping their eye on that um, okay. I also think that there's a that there's a role that um, code enforcement plays in that to kind of keep commercial trash commercial and residential, residential. Those folks used to try to maybe sneak it out, mm -hmm. um, are now being watched and bird dogged by that by okay. our code enforcement folks. So. Great, and I know the team, your team, does a great job on that. Uh, the curb cuts is one of the big issues that we get in my office. Um, arguably, uh, whether it's developer or homeowner, it's almost become a joke now that it's um, uh, what's the word? It's uh, laughable, I guess, that you'll even think about getting your deposit back. And I think we need to change that culture. So if someone's gonna cut into the curb and we're gonna hold a deposit, I'm assuming we're holding that in escrow, there's gotta be a defined start and a defined finish to the process, but when developers and residents are laughing amongst themselves, yeah. <laughs> you'll, ne <laughs> you'll never get that back, no one gets back. So I wanna know the percentage of folks that actually get their deposit back. I wanna know the metrics by which it is determined and who determines who gets the deposit back. And I'm assuming that if we do have to confiscate because it's shoddy work, then where that money goes? Does that money go to repair that actual sidewalk that was left in disrepair, or are we putting into a, the, the general fund? So definitely hear your feedback on sidewalk uh, deposits and the sidewalk repair process. It is a uh, certainly something we've heard from constituents as well. Uh, it is an area of focus for our, uh, our construction management group, and uh, Taylor, who's with us, has actually been sort of diving into the actual process essentially to answer these exact questions and make sure that we have a process that really works for keeping our sidewalks in a state of good repair and giving great clarity to those people who have money on deposit with the city. So we'll loop back to you with sort of the answers to these questions. Yeah, or at least identify the contractors that are doing good work and exactly. are restoring the curb to its initial condition yep. and let them and up for air. Exactly. But, when, but when people are laughing about it, Chief, right? When they're yep. laughing about it, and they are, developers and residents, <laughs> yep. yeah, don't, <laughs> don't even, that's, that's a problem. That's a problem, and that's on us to find the, the, the uh, it's a two-way street. So it's one thing, So, but if, if we're throwing the head fake on these people and we're just taking the deposit, because yeah. we, we have other uses for it, then uh, so that, that, that curb cut deposit program, I think needs, someone needs to crank that sucker down and find out what are the rules of the road here, what are we expecting these folks, yeah. what are their expectations, um, and how we manage that a little bit better. We're about a month into doing exactly that, and so look forward gotcha. to working with you on it. Very good. And then um, I, I have not, I've yet to receive an update on the Congress Street and or the Summer Street um, improvements here. So I, I would suggest that, because uh, I'm, I'm suggesting yep. uh, uh, an amendment to reduce the capital to the tune of 16 million 190. So I would suggest that maybe uh, this Thursday at 1030, uh, you come in and you brief uh, Council Flynn and I on what these plans are. Uh, I need to know um, if we're losing a lane of travel, because if we are, you're not getting the money to do that. I need to know if we're losing any metered spots, because if you are, you're not getting the money to do that. So I have not been updated on it. I think I'm getting slow danced here. I'm not going away. Council Flynn's not going away. So my suggestion um, through the chair, uh, 1030 in my office on Thursday for an update on both Summer Street and Congress Street because between Public Works and the BRA, if you think you're gonna slow dance this thing, and if you think I'm not gonna pay attention to it, and then just get the funds, and then just start to implement this stuff, I got a problem with it, and, uh, and I'm letting you know right now. So my friendly amendment uh, will be filed to reduce the capital to the amount that says here, 13,690 and 22.5 million. If I don't have an answer and or plans and designs, I wanna see it all. I wanna see it all by this Thursday at 10.30. And I assume that that's in your department. Absolutely, Councillor. So I don't know why I'm getting slow danced, and I don't know why we're, getting, we're putting the swerve on the district councillor here, but if you're moving forward for $16.19, $16 million, and no one has gotten an update, I know the community hasn't been updated. So that's my question. 
So the, the Summer Street project that is, that is moving forward is the one that we had spoken about, which is the one that goes from the Four Point Channel, essentially Melcher Street, to West Service Road. There's no reduction in travel lanes, uh, and as we had sort of worked through, uh, I think we did everything we could to sort of minimize any uh, potential reduction in the number of uh, meter parking spaces. Uh, and so happy to sit with you and go through the specifics of Summer Street, and happy to go through with you the specifics of Congress Street. That is separate from the separate planning money for West Service Road to the Reserve Channel, which is the sort of the longer term sort of redesign of Summer Street in that section, for which, as you know, we, we have not even gone to bid on the sort of the design consultant for that actual project. All right, but there's active discussions among sort of an ancestral group of transportation consultants that uh, seem to be hanging the hat on a bus rapid transit, which will reduce the lane of travel in each direction. Not gonna happen. And if, this, if these are the funds that are gonna be used for that, you're not gonna have the funds for them. Because uh, I'll put a line item in here, reducing it. Council role, we cannot increase, mm -hmm. but we can decrease. And I'm happy to extract that, the funds out, and we can go back to the drawing board uh, on that issue. Along with the meters, you and I have, uh, we've had very mm -hmm. frank discussion yep. on that. We have the parking meter fund, but it seems like someone's making decisions here to eliminate parking meters and the very precious revenue that goes with it, that goes into the parking meter fund so that we can fund this. And it's not gonna be nickel and dime everybody and continue to jack up fees and fines uh, if we're going to take a meter off, then we need an explanation as to why it's coming off. We also need to identify another location in that immediate area and or in the city yeah. that replaces that meter because that revenue is very precious to the city. Agreed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, can I, I wanted to follow up on uh, the ComAv 2, 2 a project, mm -hmm. uh, where we are, when it's coming to an end. Yep. Uh, so, uh, Par Jim Glue could probably give you the uh, sort of a more comprehensive update. We're roughly 50% of the way through construction. The majority of the sort of curb changes will be done by the end of this year, with a lot of the finishing and certainly the plantings probably in 2019. And the, the, the second piece of that is something which Par's team is working on, which is the uh, phase three and phase four, which right. takes that work yeah. through Packard's Corner out through right. the, uh, the Harvard Ave intersection, et cetera. And, and, uh let me compliment the work of, of PARA, working with me, the community, uh, for these great projects, starting with uh, Phase 5, I think. <laughs> phase 5, we're kind of working our way backwards, but um, I appreciate that, that work, and I saw the funding in for three, uh, Phase 3 and 4. Do you have any idea when it will go from design to construction? For phase three and four, yeah, it really uh, depends upon our ability to sort of access money from the tip, from the yeah. sort of the state pool of financing. It is a very highly rated project in the tip, but it is yet to receive tip financing. Great. Okay, um, Councillor Janey. Thank you. Um, so earlier, I you know thanked you for you know all of your good work, been very helpful. I think I would add to that list, there are so many, but certainly would like to um, give a shout out to Tracy Lithcutt, who has been extremely helpful uh, to me, um, learning how to navigate uh, City Hall. Um, um, in terms of the Hokie system, so just to build on what Councilor Flynn was saying, and I already sang the praises of Eroy, Eroy uh, in my district, what would it take to expand the program. So Dudley Square, which is where Eroy is, it's not just a commercial district, but it's also a major transportation hub. So mm -hmm. the foot traffic through Dudley is just crazy. How do we get that year round and then also uh, additional people? So I think part of that is a, is a, is a partnership with the T um, to kind of work on where our parcels are, where their parcels are, and how do we sync up our assets um, in operation. Um, the, as far as the actual cleaning of um, that entire footprint, to your point, um, the folks come through there, um, quote unquote, through their asset onto our streets, um, and how do we better sync that up? And we've actually worked with um, Eric, Eric Stuhoffer from the T on different operational discussions, whether it be snow, or, um, or, or, or other type work, and that's probably where that window is. Um, as far as expanding the Hokies, um, we are. We're actually hiring, as we talked about um, as recently as today, um, about, about that expansion. I think that, um, to the Chief's point about um, reallocating funds into FTEs where it matters most, um, that's where it matters most. Um, that's, those are lower paid jobs um, through the, through the um, AFSCME career ladder, but it's certainly a career ladder. Right. Um, our supervisors, who you've named, 
every one of you have named um, started off in some way, shape, or form um, in that role. Our assistant superintendents, Norman Parks and um, Danny Nee, um, again, that's, it's kind of where that career ladder started. Um, I think that every year the mayor's looking at us towards, towards more Hokies. Our summer allotment and spring allotment gets larger seasonally. Um, he's also given us more permanent. For the first time ever, you're going to see a job title called Hokie. We always laugh and joke, what's a Hokie? We've made it a something that you can actually Google and find now. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical job title. Um, and I think that the starting with these six new ones, um, we'll, I think we can prove to grow on that to help us 12 months out of the year. Um, we, we do keep a presence. Norman and um, Daryl Kaiser in District 10 do a great job of Dudley Square's a thing. Yeah, you know, they've been great. Daryl's been amazing yeah, as and well. We have to give them the resources, yeah. um, and that's on us. Wonderful. Um, sticking with Dudley, um, are there plans to bring meters? So, and this is mixed. So here's some folks who don't want to see meters, but I think a lot of the businesses in the area yep. um, have mentioned parking as a challenge, as well as you know residents. There's the school department there. Even though I think they put in two-hour signs, people overstay their parking, yep. and it's it's a big concern for residents for business owners, for everyone who's coming through Dudley. So are there plans, and if so, what is the community process to really make sure we're hearing from everyone? Yeah. So there, there are not plans yet, but I, as Councilor Flaherty mentioned, you know, we, are, we are very interested in seeing if there are places in the city, particularly in sort of neighborhood retail districts where you want greater turnover at the curb where a meter would make sense, but be that in a municipal lot, be that curbside. We're interested in hearing your feedback. Uh, Commissioner Fiandaco, who you'll be with next week, sort of really spearheads that process. And so if, if you think there are either in any municipal lots in Dudley Square or stretches of Warren or Washington or other places, we're very happy to sort of to hear that and to engage in a community process, probably with the Main Street District, uh, about exactly. how to roll that out. No, I would, I would encourage that and certainly want to continue that conversation. Um, in terms of fines, so while I found your office to be very responsive, I think there have been some challenges. Residents have called deeply concerned and troubled that um, when they don't do what they're supposed to do, let's use snow removal, snow. for example, um, they're getting fined. So if the, if the snow's not completely removed or if it's, it wasn't done in a timely way, they're getting a fine, but that there's city property that hasn't shoveled snow and nothing happens. And so I would make you know, the, the pitch for the city being a leader and, and not penalizing residents. And then yeah, you know, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So if we're going to say that this is our system and yep. people are going to receive fines, I think it's important for the city to be a, a model. So to that point, um, Mayor Walsh has a strict edict that we are to ticket Anybody, any agency, any individual, if they're, if they're if they're not making an effort, which is which is how the effort it's, it's that it's that 42 inch, make an effort. Um, snow can be tough, it can ice. Um, we are ticketing everybody, um, and having give, been given that edict four years ago when code enforcement came to us, we're seeing departments do a better job. We're seeing. Uh, outside agencies doing a better job. It's not perfect, it's, and, it, and, it, and it isn't perfect yet. Um, but I can tell you, every winter, departments look at us and know we're ticketing them, um, which can make for some awkward interactions. But um, we've, I've ticketed, we've ticketed our own site, um, that backside of um, that Highland Yard, Ritchie Street. It's just that you forget about that part. These guys work 26 hours for a snowstorm, but we ticketed us because it wasn't shoveled. Well, um, it's only fair. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Absolutely. it is occurring, and I do think it's, I think that these agencies and these departments are, are, are vastly improved, um, and they know about it. They know it's coming. Okay. Um, in terms of, so there are a couple of issues in the south end that have come up. So there are these private alleys. One, there's an issue around just trash collection. You know, where the barrels go, um, there, there's one in particular that has been for years and years placing it on the opposite side of the street because that has been the, the tradition. And now I, I think there's a hotel there that has uh, issued some complaints. And so there's some confusion around what happens for residents there who don't have kind of the regular curbside. Mm -hmm. Um, they keep their trash in the back. And then there's ownership issues of the alleys. So these are private alleys, issues around water pipes, 
who's responsible for repairs right now because they're private, it's the residents. You have, you know, and one might make the argument that there's uh, more disposable income in certain neighborhoods and maybe they can take that on, but there are private alleys all throughout the city of Boston and not everyone. And there's still a question of who really should be responsible and does the city have a responsibility in, in helping to cover the cost of maintenance and repair of of the water pipes underground. Do you have a response or thoughts on so, that? So uh, specific to the water pipes, um, Boston Water and Sewer does have a betterment policy, uh, which uh, we can walk through with, uh, with you or any constituents that you would like us to walk through. It, essentially, they will do an assessment, and there's a way in which uh, I believe is sort of a cost sharing for the water and sewer infrastructure. It is not dissimilar from something which uh, Council Edwards has also raised, which is around how we think about uh, supporting residents and potentially converting a private alley to a public way. Um, for that, uh, our PIC, uh, Amy Cording, would uh, need to receive a, a petition from essentially 50% of the residents that then triggers a community meeting about uh, with all the relevant abutters uh, where we sort of go through what the actual process looks like. If it looks like the abutters want to actually uh, make that conversion from a private way to a public alley, we then will do a, a cost assessment. Uh, in the past, that has typically meant around a fifteen to $20,000 bill per uh, per resident, uh, with the city basically assuming 50% of the actual cost. Uh, and then that is either, can either be paid by each abutter either upfront over a 10-year time, uh, time frame or uh, if there's a sort of a hardship application over a 20-year time frame. That essentially is the, the typical path to conversion from a private way to a, a public way. Um, it is often, though, that residents, for a number of reasons, actually prefer not to go down that path, in part because they do lose some control over things like uh, parking rules in that, in, in, in that space when it goes from a private way to a public alley, but if, or a public way. But if that's something of interest to any of your constituents, we're more than happy to walk through that process uh, with them, and I can also make the right connections with water and sewer if it's specific to water pipes. Yeah, there are also issues around um, drug use, um, sex, disposal of needles yep. and other items in the private ways. I mean, all over our city, but in the, the private ways in particular, these private alleys, um, particularly in the South End. Yep. Um, that's it for me. How many do we have all together that we needed to do? When do we expect to be done 100%? 25,000 and by 2025. Wow. 25,000 by 2025. Wow. They'll change the rules again. Um, which we are, we, we think we're actually well on track to do. Great, perfect. Thank you for that. And then um, the, there, I don't, I think it came up a little bit and I'm not sure if it's 100% with, within this department, although I, I think it's under your, your uh, cabinet. Uh, but the design and placement of some of the new utility poles, yep. um, I think that's through the improvement, the pick. Uh, but can we talk a little bit about the selection process, the design, and why there are some differences Absolutely. In, in that design and in different neighborhoods? These are the, the DAS poles, the distributed antenna uh, poles. The big, ugly utility poles. Yep. Uh, so that's how I, well, no, but I they're agree. actually, let me rephrase that. Most of them are big and ugly. There are a few that are pretty that don't end up aesthetically pleasing, not right. pretty, that yep. don't end up in our neighborhoods. They end up sort of in the downtown corridor. Yep. So there are uh, six different companies, telecom companies, that have uh, essentially an agreement with the city of Boston to put wireless infrastructure in place on our streets. Uh, sorry, two of them just merged. We have five different companies that, are, that have this right. Um, they all essentially abide by a common set of design standards. Um, these are design standards that essentially are intended to replicate what the other poles on the block look like. Um, so if you have an acorn pole, they are looking to replace it with something that looks like an acorn pole, if it's a cobra head, et cetera. Um, and so they are essentially doing a like-for-like -like replacement. Um, we certainly do want to make sure that as much as possible that these lights are uh, remain aesthetically pleasing even when they do have the telecommunications cabinet around the bottom or, or halfway up the pole and we realize that they don't always achieve, they certainly don't achieve the same aesthetic look as, uh, as the regular poles. This is something which uh, Mike Donaghy from our street lighting team is spending a lot of time uh, coordinating uh, work around. So if there's a specific design that you feel like uh, is, does not look good, we can take a look at seeing if we can modify what the design standard looks like. All, all of them, 
<laughs> all of them are pretty displeasing yes. to the to the eye. I think there's also a challenge with some of the um, some of the work that's just the equipment that gets attached yep. to a pole, mm -hmm. and in some instances, it's a I think at a very low height, yep. um, which can be dangerous. But it's also um, I think just kind of trashy looking, to be honest. Um, the other the other question is. You know, are we spending any of our resources on this work? So uh, the city does receive revenue from the polls. It depends upon <coughs> uh, the company itself, whether we get basically $2,500 per poll per year or a flat fee plus a, a portion of the revenue that actually comes from those polls. Um, we do spend uh, some of our time, though, uh, our resources, making sure that they're following the appropriate process, making sure that they're adhering to the design standard, and that uh, and increasingly this has sort of been a focus of work for, uh, for Mike and for Kathy Garcia, who's also uh, with us today. It's making sure that they are actually <coughs> abiding by what they said they would do by the design documents, that they're actually installing them in the right location, that they're not leaving the second pole up, uh, and that they're actually leaving appropriate amount of sidewalk width for there, for there to be a clear path of travel. If you think that there's any violation mm -hmm. of any of those things, please do let us know. This is a, uh, certainly a hot button issue for us, and we can gladly connect you with some of the telecommunications companies if you've got specific feedback for them as well. I, I will, and I appreciate that. With the, with the uh, revenue from those polls, is that yes. earmarked to particular it's programming? General fund. General, general fund. General, general your yeah. fund or general city fund? General city fund. And then the additional Wi-Fi access that it's creating, yes. is that for the Wicked Free Wi-Fi? No, is that for their own subscription Wi-Fi? It's essentially the 3G, 4G sort of network, and someday supposedly the 5G network that we're all using on our cell phones. Yeah, one of the things I'd really like to see is it to increase, um, I, whether it can increase some of the Wi-Fi capacity in our schools, which are really there, the, those um, systems yep. are overburdened. Yep. Um, but then also we have a number of larger family shelters in the city of Boston that don't have free Wi-Fi. Yep. Uh, and I think that that could be a uh, way to support some of the work um, that's happening in those shelters with, with our families in particular. Um, and, I, and I do think that we have to take a look at, um, you know, the revenue is nice, but at what price are we giving up some of the aesthetics and knowing the revenue that these telecommunications companies Agreed. are really mm -hmm. making on our back? Um, there are uh, two uh, main uh, roadways that weren't, I don't think were brought up, but Mattapan at the intersection of River Street I know is on yep. your list of capital improvements, but does that include the area not up Cummins Highway but up towards Edgewater Drive? We had done a, a walk through with both the Main right. Streets folks and some neighbors yep. in that area. We just did some work at Edgewater. And, and Councillor, if, if you would permit me to get back with you to make sure that what you are speaking of and what we want to do or what needs to be done mm -hmm. is the same and congruent matter, if that is okay with you? That would be great. We'll yeah. make sure that that area is being um, looked at so we can follow up offline. And then American Legion Highway slash the desired parkway. parkway. I, I, we talked about this a year ago. Yeah. Um, what is and where does planning for American Legion um, sit what's what's happening with yep. American Legion so the uh so the next project of the, that is sort of moving forward is a neighborhood slow streets that's essentially adjacent to that. Uh, one of the five neighborhood slow streets that's moving forward is adjacent to American Legion uh, Highway. Um, we also did some work uh, essentially at the southern end where there's sort of a, a significant curve to actually uh, make some safety improvements to slow speeds in that particular area and add some additional protection for cyclists who may be going through that corridor. Uh, I realize that is short of what the broader community envision is for what American Legion Parkway could uh, could look like, and so we're, we're happy to continue to work largely through our Green Links uh, program, which is funded through the BTD budget, to look at what American Legion uh, Highway could look like in the future. Great. And then it's um, somewhat related to American Legion, but just in general, um, it has come up a number of times over the course of the course of the year. Um, but crosswalks, I know that lies a lot with transportation, yep. but as we talk about restructuring any length of roadway, um, what, what's the typical distance between crosswalks on any stretch of road? Is there a measurement? I don't think we have a particular standard unless part, it's yeah. part of our guidelines. Council, it's a fine balance between 
managing expectations both from a pedestrian's perspective and from a vehicular perspective because if there are too many then the drivers may not pay attention to someone who decides to cross without waiting to see whether the car is coming so there are not exact standards but we try to put them where there's a high pedestrian desire line between one side of the street to the other side of the street so this type of matters are studied not to nauseating detail, but to some effective detail within the Boston Transportation Department to ensure that the crossings are complementary to ensure both pedestrian safety and minimize driver awkward expectation. I would add two uh, quick notes. Um, one of the feedback, one piece of feedback we've heard uh, consistently related to your question, Councillor, is that often when there's utility projects that happen within an intersection that sort of disrupts part of the crosswalk, it can often take a long time for that crosswalk to be appropriately restriped. Our construction inspection unit is making this a focus for the right. course of this calendar year and really giving uh, sort of making sure that to the extent possible within 14 days that crosswalk is, is restriped. If you see any issues like that uh, throughout the city, just, just let us know. Similarly, as part of our routine resurfacing work, we are increasingly trying to see if there's ways which we can not just replace what is but make it better, and that includes looking at things like raised crossings in certain areas of the city. I like raised crosswalks. What's, I, I know. <laughs> I, what is the financial cost of, of installing a raised crosswalk? I mean, I know that there can be a little bit of a, spe of, of a spectrum of cost. Um, I defer to Parr a little bit on this, but I think it depends a lot on the drainage and the implications so, that's on the drainage. Again, uh, council, depending on the size of the roadway, uh, right. we try to use them prudently, raising a crosswalk, because public safety vehicles have always a concern about having a patient inside the ambulance, which I have experienced, where you don't want to sort of bump, jump up and down with your needles coming through. So it's a fine balance where we try to look at the incremental safety benefits of having a raised crosswalk so that it doesn't get out of uh, vogue or out of style. So we never look at, cost is not the leading consideration, it is the effectiveness, and when it is needed, we do implement them. And there are a variety of projects which we are currently designing that includes raised crosswalks. Great, thank you, that's it for me. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Thank you. Um, so Mike, when you issue that, tish, uh, that ticket for Highland Street, did you actually pay it? We paid it. Yes. Sir. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mr. Sweeney was very watchful of that ticket. <laughs> wow. Okay, yeah. good. I didn't think you would pay that, but thank Oh, I, you. I, pay, all, I pay all those bills. You pay I, everything? I, I've paid for all the violations that um, we have incurred. Okay. Right. Good. Um, Chris, can you talk to me a little bit about um, Bruce Fulford's leaf site? How are we doing out there? Sure. Lent the contract, contracts up. Soon, I same, think. What, what are the, the intentions? Yep. Same as the, as the other contracts that will expire June 30th of next year. Um, obviously, the, our ability to do composting within the city is a great asset for us. Uh, we have been working with City Soil, as you know, to make sure that they can uh, process the volume of yard waste that we are taking, and we will continue to have those conversations see if we can support them in doing that. We need to make sure that whether it's storing it on that site or processing it elsewhere, that we're actually able to keep pace with what residents are putting on their curb. Do we have more space there, though? Would, if we granted him more space, would he so, be able to process So more? we have some limitations, and Mike can probably speak this better than I can. So basically related to our agreement with the Audubon uh, Nature Center. Uh, so we cannot expand uh, in volume. Uh, we do have, we've been looking for some flexibility with Audubon and with City Soil, but there's a limit uh, likely to how much we can actually process on site. That's fair. Yes. Through the, through the Audubon? They have a limitation now. Yeah, collectively, there's sort of a limitation on how many cubic yards we are supposed to be storing at the at the city soil site. What does a cubic yardage mean? Like, what does a cubic yardage matter if it's managed properly and the site isn't a mess, which the way it was under the previous contract? Right. I mean, with great credit to Rob, who I think has spent a lot of personal time uh, trying to get the site from what it was to to where it is today. I think that you get you run into some issues around just the sort of the, your actual ability to have a clean, manageable, safe work site uh, if you do get beyond the 12,000 yards, 12,000 cubic yards. Uh, yeah. right 6,000 6, cubic yards. Yep. And does he have more capacity for that, or, or is that? We would have to. Right now, he is bumping up against the capacity on the actual site. We definitely have an interest in figuring out how do we actually help city soil process more cubic yards sort of on site so that we can actually get stuff from the curb to a site to community gardens in a timely manner. And is he able to sell his product now? He is. 
like can he sell a, a whole dump truck full of it or just like two? We did put some restrictions in place. Uh, what and they? Uh, in terms of, I think, the volumes he could sell, how much it was local retail versus sort of wholesale. And we can get back to you on the specifics. Now, what about the guy across the street? Do we do any business with him? What's so, he? Yep, so we do Express? some work with Landscape Express where we'll take some addition, some of the additional uh, yard waste that we can't handle at city soil and be able to take that to Landscape Express. And is the deal the same? Does he get the same amount of money for what for what he's doing? Or I will loop back to you on that. I'm not sure what the uh, if there's a differential at all. Are you familiar with with um, there was a there was a grant on the table that was supposed to go over there for three hundred thousand dollars that never got moved that never got moved along? Do you know? Are you familiar with that? Is this around sort of the, the berm between? I don't know. What, I don't know what that. The, but there was a three hundred thousand dollar grant that was yes. supposed to in part go over to him that never was never moved along on our part. I'm happy to talk to both you and to Bruce Walford about that. I okay. don't know the details. Okay. Um, um, so all the all the all the new uh, safe streets zones, do they all come through you, Chris, do you like you have sign off on those you have direct yes. oversight on those? Uh, the, uh, we follow a fairly sort of data-driven process in that. Really, we're looking for places where there's a high number of elderly and youth and a high number of crashes within sort of geographically contiguous residential blocks. Um, but what's the, what's the plan with, have you seen anything on Hancock Street near the dot block there, that strip of, it's just from, just outside of Kane Square to Dot Ave. Yep. Are you familiar with that at all? Or um, I have, is there any plan there? Not that I've seen, but I'll look back to you and see whether there is. Okay, in Richview Street, did you see any plan there for changing streets around, or? I have not, but I'll look back to you on that one as well. Okay, yeah, I, I think there was somewhat of a plan on Richview Street. Yeah. I don't know where it is now. Um, if you can just look, if you can just look into that a little bit, yep. Chris. Um, I, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Flynn. I, I just wanted to follow up. I know you highlighted it earlier. You were upgrading over 900 ramps to ADA compliance. Um, how many more are left that you need to do? Okay. So about 60% 60, 60 of the 25,000 are done. Okay. So about 40% of, of that left. About 10,000 ramps to go. I noticed a lot when developers would be doing construction project that um, it seems like they'd almost take a little bit of the, the sidewalk um, for, their, for their own property, um, for their own development, and it's limiting the access for the elderly, for the, for the disabled. Um, at times they can't walk the sidewalk if there's a utility pole there. Um, have you noticed that as well? Uh, if, certainly that's something which we review through the Public Improvement Commission to make sure that there, we maintain a clear path of travel for everybody. If there's some specific locations, we're, we're very happy to go out there and have conversations with the utility company if it seems like their pole is encroaching on, uh, on the appropriate sort of width of sidewalk. Yeah, and some of the, some of the ramps are not, are not inside the um, crosswalk itself. They're off to the side. So I notice elderly people in, in those in wheelchairs walking down the ramp and then going down the street a little bit into the crosswalk, crossing the street, and then moving off to the crosswalk, out of the crosswalk, to the ramp. It's not, it's not um, in the same area, it's not in the same system. How much effort would it take to make sure that that's in compliance? I think what you're identifying are places where we've fixed the ramp before we've resurfaced the street, so the, side, the crosswalk hasn't necessarily been restriped. Uh, and we are looking to make sure that our resurfacing program and our sidewalk and ramp program are synced. It's been a big focus of our construction management division over the last year. Is there a lot of those cases throughout the city? There are some, and we're certainly working back through them. If there's some that particularly rise to the top for you, though, just let us know. I notice that a lot, a lot in South Boston, a lot in the South End. Um, it's public safety hazard, in my opinion, uh, for the elderly and for the disabled. Um, pedestrian safety, I think, is the number one issue in the city. And at times, our, our streets and, it, it are unsafe for the elderly to, to cross. I see mothers with little kids trying to cross the streets, and 
um, cars are speeding by them. Um, you know, I think we need to do a better job making sure that pedestrian access is the most important part of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How, how safe is, are the bike lanes um, making our making it for residents to cross the street as well. I, I noticed there's a new bike lane in Chinatown on the main street there. Um, does that make it safer for pedestrians to, pedestrians to cross the street? Is it safer for um, the bikes driving by? With yeah. So our design team has spent uh, a tremendous amount of time working with uh, Becca Wolfson from the Boston Cyclist Union, among others, uh, to think about how we improve safety for everybody, whether you're driving or you're walking uh, or you're riding a bike. The Neyland Street uh, bike lane that you, you reference, uh, it certainly is sort of a protected bike lane and has a set of flex posts uh, in other sections of it. Um, that's the sort of thing which gives cyclists a, a degree of separation from uh, the flow of cars, which can uh, make the road more comfortable for both people who are driving and people who are, who are biking. Uh, and it can give a little, a little greater visibility to sort of uh, both pedestrians and cyclists. So uh, we are certainly very focused on making sort of those sorts of streetscape investments that make it safer for everybody, particularly those who are most vulnerable road users, as you mentioned, uh, pedestrians and cyclists. Did you receive any feedback at all from the um, businesses in Chinatown about it? We did. We certainly got some feedback um, in advance about the need to make safety improvements along Neyland Street and some feedback uh, as well from some of the retailers about uh, how we actually make sure that there's some good curb access for, uh, for, for parking for customers in the area. Were they happy with the results? So I think that they are eager for us to figure out if there's some additional places we can find parking within Chinatown. Uh, and so we're uh, sort of interested in working with them to, uh, to find those places, uh, whether that is uh, sort of off of Neyland Street or elsewhere in the neighborhood. Okay. I know they sent me a, a bunch of yes, a signatures that they were opposed to it. Yeah. Um, it, it hurt their business um, in that area. When, what year was that done? Uh, we did that at the end of last year. The last year, okay. And my final question is, um, I know the public works employees do an excellent job. I also know you contract a lot of the services out, um, snow removal. Um, you know, down the road, can we consider hiring more full-time employees? I, I'd rather the, the work being done by city employees. They're dedicated, they're hardworking, they're, they're professional. They know the neighborhood. Uh, they love the city. Why do we have to contract so much services out? So I think I wholeheartedly agree. I think we all agree with that. Um, the, the, on this micro of it, maintaining and retaining CDL drivers is difficult. Um, working for the city provides a lot of benefits. Um, good pay, good benefits. The marketplace, what it is today, they can find it elsewhere as well um, for, for just a bit more money. We, do, we have a tough time maintaining CDL drivers. Um, but we're always, we, we post for CDL, what we call heavy motor equipment operators. We post, geez, Trish Casey's working every two months to get a, 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 a brand new list. The large part of that is we, in this city, we, on a full call out for snow, we have about 850 pieces of equipment. Um, that's from anything from a small pickup truck with a spreader to a backhoe to a bobcat to a large spreader, which is that CDL piece, front end loaders. Um, to ever get to 100% would be probably something that this city could probably never do, just the volume of asset procurement, um, buying those pieces of equipment, and then FTEs to cover those seats. It's probably two to three employees per you, truck, if you think about, throughout a storm, sick time, um, other things that, would, that, that um, would have to deal with. I think we've done a better job in hosting a lot of the, the small snow events, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that's, that, that small ice work that used to be contracted out. We are ready more ready and more capable, knock on wood, it's mother nature, um, to handle those internally with our own folks, paying our own folks city money um, uh, to, to, to handle those tasks. Unfortunately, in those named storms, those, those, those blizzards, we need so much equipment. Um, most times our contractors have trouble getting to that large number, but it's always something that we work towards. Mm -hmm. um, it's an equipment piece and a, and a, and a large scale, um, I think, FTE piece and just um, retention of talent. Then just one final observation. I you know, big departments like public works, the fire department, the police department, um, you know, when there's an opening for the head department, I always think that the new commissioner 
should come from the ranks. Um, they, again, they know the city. We have the most talented workforce, city workforce probably in the country. I just don't think we ever need to go outside of the city to bring in someone that doesn't know the city, doesn't know the department, whether it's the public works, whether it's the fire department or the police department. Let's hire from within, and these people know how to run the department. And it's, uh, it's just my opinion, it's not necessary to bring outsiders in to run a, a major city department. Any, any comments or thoughts about that? I, I think we are very fortunate to have a very, very strong team uh, within the Public Works uh, Department. And a lot of that comes, as Mike referenced before, uh, folks know the streets, they know constituents, they care deeply about uh, what's happening in our neighborhoods. And so that is the sort of skill and the sort of passion and sort of experience that uh, is, is hard to bring unless you've lived it in the past. So I understand where you're coming from. Thank you. Councilor Edwards. Questions on specific in district um, issues. I appreciate you already bringing up the Hokies. Um, the North End specifically would love some help with that. And I know you're hiring six new additional ones. Are any of them going to be in the North End? There will be. Excellent. Yep. So we actually, if I could just jump in, we did hire a full-time Hokie four months ago, five months ago, a, a gentleman by the name of Bill Milrick, who's done great work on Hanover Street, uh -huh. um, who we get praise from daily, I think, Absolutely. via emails and phone calls and 311 cases. So um, it's obviously noticed, right? People yeah. people see it more than they see anything else. And, and so with regards to the Hokie, is there any thought of expanding it d during the winter months for snow removal to follow behind the trucks? We've talked about it. Um, I think um, Council McCarthy's talked about it. We've all kind of bounced around some ideas of how those, you know, would it be an internal seasonal snow angel, if you will? Um, mm -hmm. But it would be. It, it, it's been it's been discussed. We talk about how to do snow better every year. Mm -hmm. um, and to your point, if seasonals are so successful in the summer, you know, is there something to be said for the winter work? Okay. Um, and in terms of, I, I know we talked about snow removal before you and I, but there was this. Um, still the ask about is there and you already mentioned 25 million dollars being your budget and i know this would greatly expand your budget but the snow remove are the snow melting trucks is that ever going to be something that we can consider so we tried it in 2015 we've always tried it throughout the years i think <laughs> um, previous administrations but in 2015 when it was mm -hmm. what it was um we got to try a lot of things out we, that, that's how we first <laughs> met those snowblowers they right. came up from connecticut and i think maryland um or washington um we also tried out a bunch of snow, um, I'm sorry, melters. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I mentioned about how fresh that snow is when we're picking it up um, in real time. As it sits there, it gets trash. It gets, um, and the act of snow removal is a, I'd call it a violent act. It's front end loaders, it's bobcats, it's um, backhoes. We get a lot of debris. City, city snow isn't, um, isn't clean. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, when you melt this snow, the, I think the average runtime is four hours on a melter. Then has to go down for maintenance. And when, what, what myself and uh, the former commissioner, Mike Danny, he witnessed in 15 with chunks of asphalt, shopping carts, some of Henry Vitale's assets um, inside the melters uh, was, yeah, what, a lot of hydrants, to Council Flaherty's point. Um, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just not, uh, air for, uh, airports do it and they melt it. It's fresh snow. It's brand new. We just, it's urban snow is a little different. Okay. Um, and then just also on the topic of trash and specifically in East Boston and uh, the need to either replace the open trash cans with covered ones, but also just the general need for more trash cans. I know we have over 100, I think you mentioned before, and, and the need continues to grow. Um, I think one of the biggest partnerships that I would love to help form is with our local businesses, the small bod bodegas and the small convenience stores who I think could step up sure. and work with the city and certainly have trash cans and maintain trash cans out of their place of business. But I just, I know on my normal commute when I'm taking the tea, there's just large swaths, um, Marion Street coming down thoroughfares where there just aren't sure. trash cans. So so we are not deploying any trash or recycling. Just if I can add on, we now deploy trash and recycling um, um, units. We don't just deploy trash. We try to capture as much in that in that in that diversion as much as we can, but we don't deploy anything that doesn't have that that dome or that or mm -hmm. that lid on it. Um, you do see some of those what we call tipsies that were placed out years and years ago, some by us decades ago, and some by um, the MBTA that aren't a great aesthetic. They don't hold much volume. Um, wind can grab it, um, but um, 
it's noted. We are we have I think um, Darlene Williams, who leads our, our all of our procurement very well, um, is getting us another um, 80 to 100 that mm -hmm. that 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 we'll be placing throughout the city. Um, Danny Nee mentioned to me this morning that you'll be seeing one on Bennington and Swift Street shortly. Mm -hmm. um, so we are recognizing where we need them, but. Uh, rest assured, we're not placing anything out there that does not have a lid for our own sake because we don't want to chase right. those trash after. Um, and then just on uh, the sidewalks, and by the way, I had an opportunity to meet with your sidewalk team and to talk about the equity, so I really appreciate that analysis and thank you for your hard work. Um, and just following up for some constituents in the north end, specifically about the sidewalk outside, uh, the curb outside of Bovas, um, that... Mm has been, I think, three years now we've been told it's going to get done, okay. and I, this time we've been told it's going to get done with the repavement of Salem Street. So we're really hopeful that this is, it gets done this year. Um, at a, if you've seen the extremities, it's like this difference in a, yep. almost a foot off, and so it's, it's just a dangerous thing, and I uh, really would love to see it get done this year. Um, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing, but there are you were talking about a lot of some of the cell phone towers or some of the poles. Uh, yep. I'm talking or about a t antenna boxes. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about the same, same thing? thing? Okay. So I can forward you the email with all the specific listing of the ones in the north end where we do have folks who are in wheelchairs who can't get past them. And we'll, I'm assuming we can work together about Absolutely. that location and yes. what we can do to thank you very much because it is, I mean, not all of them are listed, but there's a, a key list that we yep. can forward. I look forward to getting um, those moved. Um, if you can give us an update on the the Prado and Revere and the parks in um, in the North End. Sure. So that is largely a Chris Cook uh, okay. led project. Uh, he can give you much uh, much well, the more Paul about Revere, I think well, Yeah, for the Paul Revere Mall in the Prado. Okay. Yep. Um, right, we have a I little bit of interaction on on how you get from Hanover into the Prado, but Chris can give you the overall. Well, uh, since you brought up Hanover Street, then yeah, some exactly. <laughs> paving on Hanover, yeah. Hanover Street. If you can give me an update on that. Um, I don't know our so, timeline in Hanover. Do you know so we're currently, as you can see, a lot of construction work being done mm -hmm. out there right now. A lot of folks are trying to get into that street, we say, um, so they can get out. Um, we're, we're shooting, I think, Katie, to, to, to do it in June to, just to try to beat the feast. Unfortunately, if we don't beat the feast, then it's probably a mid-September um, after I think St. Anthony's is the, is the last one. But I think I talked to Mark Cotterelli yesterday. The target is June to get it done. Um, and thank you again by your, uh, for your efforts on Geneva Street in East Boston. Again, one of those private-public back down the middle is public. On the sides, it's private. Ultimately, um, I drove down it last night, um, and it was a, a huge improvement. Um, and I appreciate the continued conversation about how we can at least maintain it at a level. Um, could you tell me, uh, give me some updates on Rutherford Ave? Yep. Uh, so uh, BTD has been sort of leading a series of uh, community conversations, as you're well aware, um, looking at uh, sort of essentially moving the project towards 75% design uh, mm -hmm. with the idea that we will be going to bid uh, in 2020, uh, federal fiscal year 2020. Uh, and certainly as part of that, we've heard a lot of feedback from residents um, and in support of uh, or encouraging us to take a look at some of the plans that have come forward from Professor Firth. Um, so our design right. consultant has taken a look at, uh, at those and has some analysis of uh, whether there's any elements of Professor, Professor First plan or sort of either in specific or in principle uh, that we may be able to incorporate into the uh, Rutherford Ave plan. No, and I appreciate the continued conversation. I know that you guys have taken his plans and his thoughts yeah. in, uh, quite seriously and at least have taken or are willing to take from him what, yeah. what works. Um, and my final question has a lot to do with the, um, the contractor diversity. I know um, my Councillor Flynn had talked yes. about hiring, but one of the other um, entities, especially if we're going to be moving into more composting, is to look at some of our local businesses, such as Cero, yep. mm -hmm. which is a cooperative that does actual um, composting and goes around to local businesses right now and has hired many uh, or has several trucks and has grown exponentially and it hires locally, it hires veterans. And so I just would ho put in a plug in for us to look locally um, uh, when it comes to subcontracting, especially when if we're going to be expanding compost. I appreciate that. I think one of the things which we are seeing, as was alluded to, is that uh, in some ways the national and international sort of uh, challenges in the recycling market have sort of reinforced the value in having sort of more local or regional options for where we take some of our recycling products. So I I hear you, and it's something which is certainly of interest to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just want to touch on a couple of line items. Um, 
52700 repairs, services, and equipment. Looks like that number is 1.531. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up 69,000. Give me a snapshot of what those repairs and services of equipment are. Um, primarily, those are for the vehicles, um, city vehicles, that um, okay. for all the public works. Okay, 52,800 transportation of persons. So, who who are we transporting? Public the public works department. Um, well, some of the money is for contractual um, items for, um, it's mi minor, but it would be for any contracts for like the MBTA passes, and that's minor. Um, a lot of other monies are for um, conferences that individuals need to go to, and some of it is for trans like uh, the fees for going up and down, like if you go through the tunnel, and you, the those fees for... Um, that's included in there as well. So those reimburse the public works employees that go through the Ted Williams tunnel, for example. Well, we don't reimburse an employee, but they if they're in the a vehicle, they have the transponder. So it'll the, hit. It'll so hit. It's debited from the transponder. Mm -hmm. And then uh, talk about the T passes. So where is there, where would there be a situation where we're picking up the tab on a T pass? Which um, well, you ask me gets um, like a, a hit. Um, seen employees, they get. Um, it's it's not the whole um, T pass, but the, there's money that goes towards. Um, I think it's $25 per month. Which per, is part of the contract? Which is part of the gotcha. contract. It's okay. contractual that we have to pay. Very good. And then the contracted services, uh, the 6.847. So give me a snapshot of what some of those contracts will be. That repair of vehicles, the body shops, tire shops. Well, um, in the contracted services, it's under public works. It would be more or less the street sweepers um, in those types of contracted services. Okay. And then just shifting to sidewalk repair. Um, so how would one get their sidewalk on the list? Is it... Is it determined like how many cracks they have or how many chunks and chips out of it yep. uh, and or the trees that are uprooting sidewalks? What sort of, what gets them on the list of, oh, wow, we're going to get out yep. there and we're going to repair that sidewalk? Uh, so no matter what, if there's a call about a, a, a sidewalk that is that needs some work, um, our maintenance crew will go out and actually respond to that, so put into a sort of a make safe condition and improve its overall quality. Um, for most of our funding, we are shifting it towards more of an investment in building out sidewalk networks where there's whole sort of long runs of, of sidewalk that are in poor condition. We are setting aside, though, a portion of funding to do sort of perhaps more sort of Sort of, sort of surgical uh, sort of investments where a single flag might be or a single set of flags might be sort of buckling because of a tree root. So we're going to save, save some money for that and work through uh, both highway and construction management to figure out how to prioritize those locations. Right. And at one point we were experimenting with the rubber sidewalks. You know, yep. some, of, some of them were working, some of them weren't working. Are we implementing them where they do work? Um, Yep, so we are, the, the next phase actually issues? I think are in along Brighton Ave, uh, but yep. sort of as you head towards uh, the Alton, yeah. uh, Alton Village Main Streets, uh, it's less in the sidewalk panels and it's more looking at the actual tree pits, uh, so that the tree pits themselves are not uh, places that one can roll an ankle in, but instead sort of provide a, a smooth path, path of travel while uh, still allowing for water to be able to drain into the tree pits. But I mean, the, the issue is that they used to be permeable and then over time just debris yeah. and stuff clogs the print. So is there a device out there, a mechanism by which you can clean these things? Great. And question. Maybe it yeah. makes some more sense for the city to go down that road. So in this budget, there's a hundred for the first time. There's one hundred fifty thousand dollars that is going to be set aside for essentially resiliency funding. Where um, is that? Where is that? What line item is that? It is in contracted services. Under the contracted services, yeah. okay. And that is essentially what it would go towards. So we're going to see if we can find a way to clean these rubber sidewalks, and then it may make some sense to go back. Right, places where we basically sidewalks. have permeable okay. sidewalks. Very good. And then uh, from a dashboard perspective, if someone, a resident, a taxpayer, can get onto the site and see whether or not their sidewalk is hmm. slated hmm. to be repaired, are we at that stage yet? We, so we can manage people's that's expectations? A great idea. Uh, that we are not yet, but that is a good bit of feedback that we can think about for the course so of the year. So on the 311 system great where idea. someone yep. puts a call in. and, yep. Or if they're on the list... Um, just thinking they know it's going to happen totally. the following Tuesday yeah. or following exactly. Friday or within the month. Um, yep. It would be nice if we can get to that point. Um, okay. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. And then just to follow up, so Pyro, we're going to, we're going to you and Andrew, the chief, we're going to have a team so meeting this possibly. Thursday. So we're going to, well, it's going to be this Thursday at 1030, if that works for you. That's the time that I, I have available. Or sooner, Councillor. Or sooner? Or sooner. Okay. Right we're going now. to try to coordinate with Councillor Flynn's schedule as well. I know that we had talked about Thursday at 1030 works, um, if that works for you and the chief. Okay. And then just through that, I'm just going to ask that you keep this budget hearing open until my questions are answered with respect to those two capital sure. projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all. Councilor Baker. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris, can we go back to the, to the curb cuts? And I'm, I'm in lockstep with, with Council Clarity here. You don't have any 
any explanation as to why nobody's talking to the so we can walk through kind of the actual curb cut uh, or sidewalk deposit process. Uh, essentially, uh, and others can sort of explain this in greater detail uh, and greater accuracy, but essentially what uh, will happen is that somebody will uh, request for us to come out and do a review of, uh, of their sidewalk. Our engineering team will make that assessment and then inform them of whether the work, whether the sidewalk is now in a state of good repair and consequently sort of acceptable to the city, in which case they get the deposit back. Uh, or else we sort of get into a situation where uh, they need to go back and make some spot repairs uh, and we will not sort of give the deposit back until they've completed those repairs. There is a situation related to the, sort of the counselor's question before. Uh, we will use money uh, to be able to go back and make some, uh, make some permanent repairs if that becomes ultimately the better way to, to get that work done. So basically everybody's failed those inspections? No, so I, we, we do return a number of them, and I can get you, I don't have the percentage uh, yeah. on hand, but. We get I, some of them, because I yep. never heard of anybody getting their, yep. their deposit back yep. and thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, Quincy Street, is the Quincy Street redo, are we doing anything in between Columbia Road and Bolden? Is it, the, is it from Bolden all the way up to Blue Hill, or? or it is from uh, Columbia Road, sorry, Councilor, Columbia Road to Blue Hill Ave. Yep. Oh, so we're not doing, not we're not side. doing the left side. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, can you talked a little bit about, um, and maybe you can drill down on this a bit, you were saying that it almost sounded to me that we're not gonna respond to advocacy here, we're just more gonna make, so like the, the, the neighborhoods that, that care and call and are advocating for their neighborhoods, they're just, they might as well just talk to that wall over there. What, no, so the how are we going to handle that? Oh, we're talking about sidewalks and... Yeah, yeah. sidewalks or whatever sort of... Because if you're saying that for sidewalks, are all the department heads saying that for... Is Gina saying that for traffic lights? Is, is Chris saying that mm -hmm. about parks? Yep. So uh, certainly we, we actually have, are keeping that process where we want to be able to respond to any constituent that calls. So a constituent calls, the sidewalk is in a state of disrepair. We want to respond. There's a pothole in the street. We want yeah. to be able to respond. The road is crumbling. We want to be able to respond. All of those things are going to be maintained. What we've realized, though, is that with some of our capital investment, uh, we, are, we are perhaps not getting to places that haven't been invested in, in the past and where the actual engineering condition shows that it merits perhaps to be higher in the line than the number of calls that we've gotten. So the piece and that we're you're looking for larger areas. For larger yeah. areas, exactly right. So that is part of what we're actually looking at shifting to. That does not mean that ent our entire capital budget, though, will be disconnected from uh, where we see sort of high volumes of calls. That's certainly something which we'll also take into consideration. Yeah, well, because, I mean, yeah. again, I showed you Savin Hill Ave's like Formula exactly. One. We should have had the race in yes. Savin Hill Ave, you know, because that's, that's where the driving is now. And you, I, I know you're being, I know. you're being called, and why can't we speed bumps, cross, uh, yeah. raise crosswalks, something? Yeah. I'm asking you something yeah. there. It, 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 we talked about the fence the other day. Yep. Have you made it? Did any follow up on that? Yeah. So I think there's an opportunity there with Chris Cook to figure out how we actually push back the fence line. Chris and I have had some initial conversations about how to think about putting in a, a sidewalk instead of what's actually there right now. Yeah. I think this is also a place where, as part of our regular resurfacing program, uh, which is something which goes on throughout the city. We, as you are well aware, we have that interest to figure out how do we now do things that actually can do the things which you've been advocating for, putting in raised crossings, putting in speed homes, figuring so, out ways so to So in, in with the, the people that are doing the, the resurfacing, exactly. we'll, have them, we'll have them do it. Right. So we have, we've made a small shift in uh, our engineering division to allow for greater coordination between essentially the concerns that largely our transportation department hears around calming traffic and the work that our engineering team does, or our uh, construction management team does around their surfacing. So how are those safe streets, what's the reception of, do, do people, do people like them? And if they do like them, are we, is, is that plan gonna grow? Yep, that's a great question. So uh, we've heard incredibly positive feedback, particularly from uh, the council as well as constituents. Um, one of the reasons why we are also in front of you uh, a little bit later this month to talk about parking fine changes is that as part of a broader program uh, that the mayor uh, is interested in, in moving forward, which would allow us to accelerate our ability to address problematic intersections, add protected bike lanes, and ramp up our number of neighborhoods slow streets. So if that uh, package moves forward, we believe we'll be able to build about 15 neighborhood slow streets over the next four years. Okay, and I think that you should look at Quincy Street for something between Bowden and, and Columbia Road 
again, speed bumps, raised crosswalks. Yep. It's it's like a speedway there. Uh, Ashmont Street, I've been asking for raised crosswalks, speed bumps for, I've been here since the day I got here. Savin Hill Ave, same thing. Yep. So um, I, I'm not going to tell my people not to call you and advocate. They're going to continue to advocate, and hopefully we'll be able to act on some of these things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, before we go to public testimony, I just had a couple of quick follow-ups. Uh, are we hiring temps uh, for public works for the summer? We are, yes. H how many positions? So we, we took 12 on um, in the 1st of May um, for our, I'm sorry, the it, it ended up being mid-April. We did a little bit earlier once as I felt that the snow was gone. Um, and we're taking uh, 12 more on in the next two weeks. And where are they deployed, Mike? So we, so the original 12 get placed into, into uh, Hokie routes inside of districts. Um, the, the, the additional 12 um, jump in to kind of backfill those areas of high volume, high pedestrian volume, to kind of give that second or third Hokie in a, in a um, neighborhood that might have three, four, five, six squares. Um, we've got some areas that have popped up, like that um, Atkinson Street, Southampton Street, mm -hmm. um, Melnia Cass, that needs our attention more and more. Mm -hmm. So they're often, um, they'll, they'll, they'll start their day there, some of the um, um, downtown Hokies. Right. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Kenny Ryan as leading in graffiti removal Every year that I've been on the council is Alston Brighton, so I want to give him a shout out. Uh, Tim McCarthy has joined us and has uh, a question, Councillor. Yep. Thanks, Kate. Uh, quickly, I missed the second round coming around, but I was watching. I actually was watching. Just me and my father and Mrs. O'Malley watch. Um, uh, quickly, uh, the uh, wagon wheel pressed um, yep. uh, crosswalks, you know, we don't like them because they disappear real fast. They don't really work. Have we looked at any of the new material? I know you and I had a brief conversation about it, but I just wanted to see if we've talked to anybody else about new poured material that can go into the uh, crosswalks that would be uh, probably more expensive at the beginning but less expensive as far as maintenance. So as part of BTD's sort of uh, more comprehensive, comprehensive effort to look at sidewalk restriping, part of that is something to look at. What are the, what are the materials that are going to be more enduring? Or what's the right way to think about materials that might work in a bus lane, for example, as opposed to materials right. that might work uh, in a residential side street? Yeah, that, that came up with, um, you know, in Rosendale and Washington Street, right. the actual painting of it. We could never, when you and I talked about it that morning, we could never keep up with trying to paint that every you know, how many weeks it would take. So we'll have to figure something out. And then my last question would be the, uh, the poured material and the tree pits. Where are we with that? Because I know we did it at Blackstone, yep. I mean, I'm dating myself, years ago, but they're still in really good shape and the trees are going at good pace. Did, was this already asked? Uh, no, oh, we, right. we touched on it. All right, I'm yeah. sorry if it was asked. Uh, no, the next place we've done it is uh, in, in Alston. Uh, I think there are other areas which we'd be looking to sort of do it. If you've got ideas for locations, we should be exploring it. Yeah. yeah, simply because it, it um, as, as you know, some sidewalks, uh, you know, power can't make sidewalks grow. Um, but when we, when we lay that stuff into uh, tree pits, you, you, we are, it's ADA compliant, which makes it a lot cheaper for us to go along. So thanks very much, and, and thanks for uh, your indulgence, yeah. Mr. Uh, Chair. Certainly. Uh, public testimony now, Wendy Landman, Be Becca Wolfson, and Stacy Thompson, in that order, please. And... Uh, Jerry Gorman. Oh, there's, a, there's a microphone back there. Um, good morning. I'm Wendy Landman. I'm the executive director of Walk Boston. And um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And actually, thank the counselors for their fabulous questions. You asked many of the questions that I have. So I'm going to be brief, but just uh, reinforce a couple things. One is we are very excited at the expansion in the budget, um, both for public works and, and for transportation uh, that this year that we're looking at. Uh, we think there's some fabulous opportunities in there. And um, we are excited to see how all of those are operationalized. So many of our questions have to do with how to take 
this new opportunity and put it to best use. So um, that falls through a lot of, in a lot of different ways. And I want to start by thanking the city so much for taking so seriously the work that Walk Boston has been doing with the, with the Elderly Commission on benches and, and seizing the moment. I hadn't actually spotted the line item in the budget for benches this year, but we are really, really excited to see that. Um, uh, what the research has shown is that to keep seniors walking, which is a, one of the best ways for them to stay healthy and independent, is actually to have, um, number one is to have destinations close to where you live, which Boston residents are lucky to have, but number two is to actually have benches. So the fact that the city is missing them in a number of locations and uh, is looking carefully at how to uh, install benches in ways that serve all of the neighborhoods of Boston, but in particular those that have a shortage of benches, which um, as in many other cases is often uh, communities of lower income. So we're very excited that that's happening. Um, I want to talk a little bit, um, we're also very excited to see the equitable sidewalk investment program. Uh, we're again looking forward to see how that's going to get operationalized, but the fact that there have already been parts of the cities that have been identified as the places to focus early investment is terrific. Uh, we'd love to see that matched with, um, I guess I would say, a more in-depth and um, operationalizable plan for snow removal because in order to make those good sidewalks usable year round we actually need to be thinking about how snow is going to be removed which is not to say that the city should be responsible from the public works department of doing all the sidewalks but rather to set a priority plan to make sure that um, curb ramps and bus stops um, in places that in particular that are serving students and are serving seniors and are serving transit users actually we start to roll into what we're doing as a city to do particular routes to set essentially a plan for snow removal to make sure that uh, critical routes are kept open. Um, one of the things which we've obviously talked with Chris and his staff about a number of times is how to start thinking about operationalizing that and not depending entirely on the owners of adjacent properties to keep curb ramps clear, um, particularly when they're large storms. It's very difficult for individuals to do that. Um, but really thinking about how to set priorities. Where, what should we be doing as a city as opposed to um, asking uh, property owners to do? Um, I was thrilled to hear many of you ask about tree pits. Obviously, your district is, has been the new leader. We would love to see this. Uh, it's, again, a piece that came up a lot in the age-friendly walking work that we did with the Elderly Commission. Um, tree pits pose a tripping hazard, and the fact that they seem to be working well, um, that we seem to be able to clean the, the material, the permeable material, so that uh, the tree pits can be maintained, um, certainly um, in Main Street's areas that are using that permeable paving, uh, the, the sidewalks feel very, very different. It creates space actually to provide more benches. It creates space to provide some more parking for bicycles in the places that have wide sidewalks because there aren't these gaps in the sidewalk uh, where there are tree pits. So obviously we want to see trees. That's another important piece of the environment, but figuring out a way to keep doing that and keep the sidewalks. I think it actually poses a lot of opportunities to, to make improvements in sidewalk conditions in places where it's difficult because there's, there's limited space. Um, again, uh, several of you asked about crosswalk painting and maintain, maintenance. Uh, the fact that there is uh, some new thought about how to oper how to think that through strategically so we're it's not dependent on um, calls that sidewalk uh, that the crosswalk painting has faded and um, putting it into a, basically a regular uh, maintenance cycle so that we know there are certain crosswalks. I don't know whether this actually varies by neighborhood so much, because certainly there are faded crosswalks in many different parts of the city, including downtown, which because of heavy traffic, actually the crosswalks um, uh, rub out more quickly. So there are places right in the middle of downtown where the crosswalk lines are missing, and so we hope that that can be you know, built into the maintenance cycle appropriately. Um, and finally, and I'm trying to be quick because I know my compatriots also need to leave, <laughs> um, uh, construction staging. Uh, it is something that we are seeing more and more problems with. There are a number of places that are actually quite dangerous, uh, the intersection of Tremont and Neyland. Um, and I know we have had a lot of trouble getting any response at all about working on that and making sure that that's safe. So I don't know where that fits in the budget, whether there are adequate 
There seem not to be adequate staff to respond to that. Um, again, several of you brought it up. It, it can be um, relatively small streets where construction is actually blocking the sidewalk and making the path of travel inaccessible. We get tweets about that pretty often. Um, but it can also be a significant intersection uh, like Tremont and Neyland where pedestrians were really not um, paid attention to. It's, it's actually a dangerous situation. It's actually been on the news several times. Um, and so I think in terms of thinking about budget, uh, clearly we need to find a way to have better um, staffing to deal with that issue, um, thinking that through from start to finish, uh, from the permitting moment to what's actually installed on the street. So um, with that, I wanted to, again, thank all of the counselors for all of their comments, thank the department for thinking really hard about a lot of these issues, and it's great to be drilling down to more and more details as we have an opportunity to get deeper into making the city even better for pedestrians. So thanks thank very you. much. Hi there, I'm Becca Wolfson, the director of the Boston Cyclist Union. Um, thank you, uh, counselors, all for, uh, for hosting this and for all your great questions and uh, also to the staff. Um, there are a few items that I really want to um, drill in on uh, and discuss. The first is snow removal. Um, it was said, you know, I understand the challenges uh, from such uh, heavy snowfall this winter um, and did hear from several counselors that they had, had seen, observed, and heard that snow removal was very good under the circumstances, which uh, it absolutely was for streets. Um, but the bicyclist community continued to face several challenges with snow removal uh, that you know I think can be addressed through improved policy and um, additional uh, acquisition of equipment that I know you have been working really hard to acquire. Um, the first challenge came uh, on the city's signature Vision Zero corridor, um, the Mass Ave from the bridge through uh, to Symphony Hall uh, and beyond. After that first snowfall, snow was never removed for the entirety of about two and a half weeks until it melted. Uh, and that's a significant problem when you uh, think about the fact that the um, roadway has has been narrowed, uh, and, and those facilities have encouraged so many people to bike uh, that, who just didn't have a safe place. And I understand that uh, more equipment was purchased after that first snowfall. Uh, it did improve, uh, but still was not um, as good as it could have been. Uh, Melanie Cass Boulevard is another street that we keep hearing about from our constituents. On several occasions, it's been reported through 311, uh, and on several, the city has said that it's a DCR property, and we know through the, the big reconstruction project that it's absolutely city, uh, and so look for uh, you know that to be maintained in snow events. Um, and uh, you know, an, another problem that um, bicyclists face, and, and it, it's often thought that people don't bike in the winter, uh, but through a few data points that we have, we know that between 40 and 50 percent of people who bike in the warmer months actually continue to bike through the winter. Um, so it's very important to maintain these facilities and provide um, you know, an optimal separated bike network for them. Um, and we put out a, a survey to our membership and uh, to people who bike in, in Boston in this region and ask them what uh, barriers they have to biking in the winter and mainly it is maintenance of um, bike facilities. Uh, and we also asked why people bike in the winter, uh, and mainly it's because public transit is unreliable. So you know, if we can keep, this, uh, keep these facilities open, it just will keep more people in the city moving, which we know is a priority of the city of Boston. Um, one other thing that we're really looking for is a plan. Uh, so, you know, to have accountability within the department, which again, uh, many of the things that you've said today, uh, you really value that, would be to uh, implement and create a snow removal plan um, that's transparent, that uh, the people of Boston can see and can know when to expect bike facilities to be cleaned, the streets, uh, what to expect with sidewalks um, as well. DCR has a really robust policy, and so we know when the Southwest Corridor hasn't been cleared uh, when to expect that. And it also can help curb um, comments and input from uh, people you know, who, who have expectations to know, you know what to expect. Um, and 
we're also very thrilled about the, the sidewalk equity program uh, and definitely are looking for something similar when it comes to uh, bike infrastructure improvements. One thing that you know we hear from uh, this department, from Public Works in Cambridge, is that separated facilities are much easier to clear. Uh, and when they're networked, you can get that equipment from one facility to another. And so, you know, when we're looking for bike facilities in Roxbury, uh, between Roxbury and Dorchester on Mass Ave, uh, you know, we have concerns that some pushback might be it's not going to be able to be cleared. So, you know, the more uh, you build with the bike network up front, the better return on investment you'll have with the public works department. And so, want to encourage rapid implementation. Um, and, and just another thing with snow removal is uh, a desire to see some innovation. Uh, we know two winters ago you experimented with a brine um, on bike facilities, I think was very successful, and hope that you can continue to expand that. Um, something that Cambridge has been experimenting with that we'd also like to see is what we call, or what is considered a Montreal style snow removal, uh, where cars um, are required to be moved similar to what you do with um, street sweeping. And then you can really clear curb to curb. Uh, because that becomes an impediment to people being able to park curbside, so they park further out, which again impedes on bike facilities typically, or um, regular travel lanes. So that type of snow removal would be something we'd love to see the city experiment with. Um, and, and one other um, policy that I'd love to touch on in budget item is this state of good repair. Uh, last year, we were thrilled with the increase in the state of good repair, uh, and, and still, uh, you know, are very happy that that's in there. Um, but that was really touted as a vision zero opportunity. Um, that every time you know streets are repaved or restriped, it would be an opportunity to make them safer for people biking and walking uh, and driving. Uh, and and there have been some really great opportunities where the city has taken advantage of uh, repaving and restriping, uh, for instance, Neyland Street um, and Columbus Ave, which should be coming up, which we're very excited about, and so are um, so many residents and constituents. Um, some examples where that hasn't occurred um, are Congress Street, uh, which in Go Boston 2030 uh, bus um, Bus facilities were promised, as well as bike, uh, and and nothing happened there. Uh, and we were told, you know, it was due to uh, inadequate time to coordinate that, and so more staffing, more, better coordination, um, and a real commitment to implementing the Go Boston 2030 and Vision Zero improvements with every project is necessary. A few other examples where um, those opportunities were missed or lost um, are Preble Street and Farragut Street in South Boston. Both are incredibly wide, uh, encouraged speeding and could have easily been narrowed and bike facilities added in both abut parks um, that are utilized by a lot of children. Um, one thing that we've spoken with a few uh, city councilors um, and mentioned to staff, in New York City, they're exploring a policy um, called the Vision Zero Street Redesign Standards, where every time a street is repaved, there's a commitment and design standards uh, to making it fit within uh, Vision Zero standards. And we're really hopeful that Public Works and Transportation can work on that. And we'd love to work on that with you um, to develop something for Boston. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I promise to be brief. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone on the council, council and to the staff. I think two hours digging into public works um, is an indication that folks in this room really care about how the city runs and cares about things people don't think about every day, like garbage and recycling and Wi-Fi. So um, just thank you to everyone. I also want to give a shout out to Kate Sullivan, who helped um, my staff understand the budget process and That's is second. working really hard. Um, and I do just want to also give a shout out to the Public Works folks who've been um, so helpful on the Washington Street bus pilot. I know that it came up several times, but it, my understanding it has been the most uh, popular Go Boston 2030 project to date, and we're hoping to see much more sort of BRT and bus activity in the future. Um, so lots and lots of thank yous to go around. I scratched my comments because so much has been covered, and I took notes to just try to reflect what I heard today. I'd like to echo what my colleagues at the Cyclist Union and Walk Boston had to say, um, and for folks who don't no livable streets. We have a membership of about 10,000 people. Um, more, nearly 70% live in the city of Boston, and all of my staff are Bostonians, so we're also here as constituents. Um, and we had a very brave 
in turn um, volunteer watch all of the transportation related hearings from last year so that we could follow up on a few items. Um, I want to echo the calls for snow removal. We all came here last year asking for a deeper plan around um, uh, how do we ensure that our critical services um, like our schools, health centers, senior centers, um, bus stops and T stops are prioritized and how do we ensure that we have a um, transparent and public plan for that. So we'd love to work with you this year to make sure that that's a reality. So it's not just our, our major thoroughfares, which it sounds like we're taking care of um, really well last year, um, are taking care of this year. Um, and I do want to echo the state of good repair remarks that my colleague Becca brought up. Um, I would like to flag that um, uh, Councillor Baker brought up the question of Columbia Road last year, and he was given the exact same response, um, meaning that we, you know, there's a lot of excitement around planning, and we haven't really done much in the last year, and we know from our own engagement over the last couple of years that folks in that corridor are really fatigued by plans and discussion without actually having a plan for implementation and funding. So we'd really like to hear and have more clarity on how we're moving from, you know, placemaking, envisioning, to a, a plan to ensure that we have great Vision Zero, Emerald Network, and Better Buses um, projects going on in that critical corridor. Order. I'd also like to flag that um, uh, Councillor Sabi George asked about American Legion and got the same response last year. And as far as we know, in talking to your staff, there isn't a plan to really do much on that corridor this year um, outside of the, the neighborhood slow zone. So um, knowing that it is also a Vision Zero priority because it's not safe and that there are a lot of folks in that corridor who maybe don't have a lot of time to elevate their concerns because they have other things going on in their life, we'd like to see these um, issues elevated. So um, we have another transportation hearing. I'm going to leave it there. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And we'll see you at the next budget hearing. <laughs> thank you. I just want to thank you all for uh, your time, attention, and talents today. And this hearing stands adjourned.